So here we are, we are undertaking a difficult journey. I'm Vidya Dinka, uh, coordinator of Growth Watch and president of the Indian Social Action Forum. Um, we are therefore trying to structure what we call the Indo-Bangla Energy Dialogue. And, um, and our rapporteurs are Sajad Hussain Tuhim from CLEAN in Bangladesh and Kuntal Roy from GSCC. Here we are because we have shared legacies. We have a magnificent uh, shared forest and um, of course home to the Royal Bengal Tiger. And I remember in a meeting recently, we had people from Bangladesh and India and two of us, um, uh, you know, named our special animal, the Bengal Tiger. And, um, and we were both from India and sure enough, when, uh, you know, the conversation went around the room. Most of the Bangladeshis also said the Royal Bengal Tiger. So um, there's much in common, um, not just Nazrul and Tagore. Um, there is the magnificent Sundarbans that also protect us from cyclones, from floods, etc. And as we know, they are under threat. So we're trying to structure this um, conversation. We won't, I know it's tea time. We should call it chai per chacha, but we don't like chachas. They become quite difficult. Um, they become uh, heated debates. And so um, it's more like a Bengali adda. Uh, where we try to unpack the political economy of energy investments in Bangladesh and India, and we try and seek a common understanding and a common ground for a joint campaign on energy issues, um, if we all um, seem uh, to agree. And so uh, today we'll begin with uh, being welcomed by Hassan Mehdi, uh, who is Member Secretary of the Bangladesh Working Group on External Debt. Then we shall have a presentation on Reliance's Meghna Ghat power project, an environmentalist from um, uh, Mosam, and also co-convener of one of our um, uh, one of our um, um, what do you call it co-hosts. Um, it's called Sapak South Asian Peoples. Oh my God! Activists on the climate Action. crisis. Action, Action on climate. Thank you, Somyada. Thank you. In fact, I must actually read out who who all are actually um, hosting this event, shouldn't I? One second. Let us have them all together. Okay, I'll go through the program. Then we have thirty minutes of Q and A, and then we'll have the concluding remarks by our other. Um, a group which is co-hosting today, LNSP, Jyotirmoy Barua, who is an advocate from the Supreme Court of Bangladesh, um, from um, also who um, has formed LNSP, will um, do this for us. Uh, let me find for us who all are actually, um, uh, you know, um, putting this, uh, this dialogue, this energy dialogue uh, across India and Bangladesh together. Um, primarily, uh, the Bangladesh Working Group on External Debt. Uh, they've had a few, um, a few um, addas like this. I'm hoping that Mehdi will actually take us through what we've done till now. Uh, also, Growth Watch from Mangalore, um, where I live. INSAF, Indian Social Action Forum, Life and Nature Safeguard Platform and the South Asian People's Action on Climate Crisis. These are your um, co-hosts or co-organizers today. Um, the energy dialogue is important. You know, while some of us um, might know the energy situation quite well, um, it's also true that um, there are some people who think that Bangladesh being the most vulnerable um, country in so many ways um, uh, needs all this energy coming its way. I think that will sort of open up as we discuss and we'll see that actually um, Bangladesh is pretty energy rich. Um, in fact, um, I think it was um, um, 2019 May, 
there was almost um, what 48 49 percent of um, of installed capacity which wasn't used because they have so much of energy so really there this is also um, unpacking the energy situation in Bangladesh and I'm hoping um, that we all approach this very, with a very open mind try and understand the country better its energy situation and of course uh, we from India uh, seem to be meddling a little too much um, in the recent past with the energy situation some big guns going uh, to set up coal-fired plants do they really need these coal-fired plants let's discuss all of this but first let us um, I think begin with um, the first presentation or rather I think some kind of um, foundation setting um, Hassan Mehdi, Member Secretary, Bangladesh Working Group on External Debt and Executive Director at Clean uh, Bangladesh. Uh, Hassan, do I need to introduce you more? I think most people here do know you. Um, Thank you. Hassan is somebody who, um, who has actually um, burst onto the energy scene and is taking on the big guns almost every day. Um, and therefore, I think it's quite fitting. Uh, that he welcomes us. Thank you, Vidya, and thank you, everybody, on behalf of Bangladesh Working Group on External Debt, uh, BWGED, and also uh, in SAP, Brotua, SAPAC, and LNSP, uh, Life and Nature Safeguard Platform. Uh, we have started a series of discussion uh, with participation of Bangladeshi activists and on our regional and uh, global friends in April uh, this year. Uh, uh, for possible collaboration and uh, developing a strategic documents or to work together on the destructive fossil fuel investments and towards an era of renewable energy uh, in line with Paris Agreement and Declaration of Climate Vulnerable Forum, where Bangladesh is also a member and now Bangladesh is also the chair of uh, Climate Vulnerable Forum. In the last three months, we have organized four webinars uh, on first one overall energy sector of Bangladesh second one, external debt, energy, and economic recovery in Bangladesh, and then a follow-up of that. And then finally, uh, in last uh, June 10, uh, it was one uh, challenges of energy sector immunity in Bangladesh. Friends from many countries, including Australia, China, Germany, Hong Kong, Hungary, India, Indonesia, Japan, Netherlands, Philippines, Sweden, Switzerland, Taiwan, Thailand, United Kingdom, and United States participated in that uh, the earlier webinars and of course some of you are uh, also there with us uh, on the path of this discussion it was raised from many corners that there is a need uh, of discussion bilaterally between activists of bangladesh and the countries from where the investors are coming so as part of the plan uh, we the bangladeshi and indian friends are going to share our insights and ideas together today We'll reach our friends from other countries in near future too. So today we'll focus on three destructive mega power plants, including Adani Godda uh, coal power plant, Rampal coal power plant, and Reliance LNG uh, based power plant. So for discussion today, we have a mix of youth and veteran experts on the energy sector, uh, climate change, and also environment. Thank you, uh, Paranjay Guhatakurata, Sridhar Ramurthy, Shomma Datta, Maha Mirja, Abid Das Gupta, Tony Naushin, and Sadhguru Singh Tuhin uh, for agreeing that uh, you are going to speak on the issues. Thanks go to INSAP, Grothwas, uh, SAPAK, and LNSP for co-organizing this webinar with us. And uh, thank you everybody who are participating now uh, and uh, hope we'll get a very lively discussion today. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thanks, Mehdi. Um, so here we are. We are going into our first presentation. Let's let's keep in mind that um, right now, um, uh, you know, um, coal is only four percent of Bangladesh's energy mix. Um, uh, gas is a little more. I'm not so sure, but I think yes, it's a it's forty seven point eight six from natural gas. Um, and uh, there are an amazing number of 29 coal-fired power plants to come up. Um, there's also gas plants to come up. 
Let's go to our young researcher, Thuheen, who's gone around to many of these sites proposed and, um, you know, in the pipeline, a little bit of construction happening. Sajad Hussain Thuheen uh, is research coordinator at CLEAN, which is Coastal Livelihood and Environmental Action Network and has been involved with monitoring several power plants, including the Bhola IPP, uh, the Barisal Coal Power Plant, the Pyra Coal Power Plant, the Summit Barisal HFO Power Plant, the Summit Meghnaghat Power Plant, and the LNG terminals run by Accelerate Energy and Summit Group. Um, Tuhin seems very young, um, but really his experience uh, far exceeds his age. Um, I know that for a fact, I've been there um, and seen some of his work. Um, Tuhin is going to tell us more about the Meghnaghat area and the power plants which are currently uh, coming up or to come up there. Yes, Tuhin. Thank you, Vidya, for uh, introducing myself. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks uh, for being here. And uh, I'm very much grateful to Bangladesh Working Group on External Dates, Coast Watch, INSAF, SETBAC, LNFC, INSAF, and other co organizers for giving me this chance to share some of the information about uh, another dirty project near Dhaka. So uh, I have made a very small presentation. So I would like to share this. So first of all, uh, as we know, the Meghnagat is very close to Dhaka, the capital city of Bangladesh. And uh, first of all, we need some information for the background work uh, about Dhaka. Dhaka uh, is uh, one of the most polluted cities on the world. Now uh, Dhaka is ranked second uh, old city for live, and uh, it is the 17th uh, uh, of uh, world uh, air pollution index category in 2019 and our uh, population in Dhaka is uh, increasing since uh, 1950s now we are dealing with 21 million people in the 300 uh, square kilometers of land and we have to deal with 35 million people by 2040. So uh, meanwhile Bangladesh is the champion of old uh, air quality index globally now followed by India China and other nations. Uh, so if we compare these two cities to big capitals of Southeast Asia, we will uh, find a very rustic similarity uh, among themselves. Uh, Dhaka ranks 17th in the air pollution. Uh, Delhi is now in 11th and Dhaka is the second old city to live and uh, fifth uh, for the uh, Delhi. And the uh, air quality index, I mean the uh, pollution index is quite similar uh, uh, to Dhaka and Delhi. So in this circumstances, if we uh, have a, a deeper look at the pollution parameters of Dhaka, it has an ever increasing number in PM 2.5 and PM 10 concentration in the air since after 2000. Dhaka air quality remains unhealthy from 1998, assessed by WHO, World Health Organization. However, in uh, 2020, Dhaka experienced a healthy air quality uh, ever since because of this pandemic outbreaks. So uh, now we have uh, 37 power plants uh, near Dhaka. Uh, if we look uh, at the fuel of those power plants, 64% uh, of them are running by natural gas, followed by 31% by HFO, uh, and only 5% uh, on uh, HSD. However, surprisingly, we don't have any renewables near Dhaka. So it's uh, 0%. For borrowers, DBDB is producing uh, 2,704 megawatt by their 11 power plants over this area, followed by Summit, uh, they're producing 1,204 megawatt now, and uh, Pentecost 450 megawatt, Warrior 450. So if uh, Reliance comes into the action, they will automatically be in the third position after Summit uh, by producing 718 megawatt by uh, LNG. So uh, let's uh, see where uh, is our project location in the ESIA of uh, uh, summit where uh, I mean uh, the Reliance uh, ESIA you will find that it is 45 kilometers away from Dhaka city. Uh, I think they are uh, concerning about the um, airports only because airport is 45 kilometers away from the project site. Actually the 
uh, project uh, is uh, located only 14.5 kilometers from Dhaka. And now uh, Meghnagat is uh, only 11.2 square kilometer of uh, island in Meghna River. And uh, it is already three power plants over there. And uh, Meghnagat alone is producing 887 megawatt now. Uh, in 2022, this number will increase to uh, 2,227 uh, megawatts uh, because uh, Summit is constructing uh, another power plants over this area along with the Reliance one. So uh, 26 heavy industries is also running at this area uh, in, uh, right now. So if we look at the, some basic information about this uh, uh, project, Reliance will put uh, 750 megawatt to this list. As I said earlier, constructing a combined power cycle uh, power plant. Uh, it's a category rate by ECR 97. Uh, this is the law of environment uh, in Bangladesh. And category A um, uh, project uh, according to ADV sector policy. It will be uh, in function for 22 years. It starts in 222. So, um, uh, after a year, it will be in uh, action. Uh, it has a huge budget of 1265 million US dollar and ADB will finance uh, 330 million. They have already passed uh, 200 million and uh, Zera will fund 645 million a Japanese company and they will hold uh, the ownership of 49% and remaining 51% will be uh, in Reliance pocket. But most interesting part of this, uh, that the guarantor of this ADV fund is Bangladesh government, which means Reliance will do the business and our taxpayer money will be there to make them up. So this is the current situation. No, I just said project. that, uh, the, uh, of course, that time only India thing was available. So I basically said that, uh, I mean, we should so, also look at this statement of reason because that actually tells the, uh, you know, the whole, uh, I mean, uh, my idea was that, you know, there are a lot of newsletter floating in the market, so to speak. So I was just thinking how... Wait a bit, please. I, I, a see. Who is that, uh, I don't know. The statement of please wait. It actually tells you why such uh, regulation or why such amendment One actually second. can take. Um, and if we could highlight some of this in the brief itself, then it yeah. kind of makes things a little bit more interesting. And to find credible. out who is it. So that was... Please uh, mute your yeah. mic. Who are you? Let us uh, go through all the presentations, please. Uh, we've requested people uh, who are participants uh, to mute their mics and, um, and their videos also need to be off. It's only the panelists who will have their videos on and only those speaking and presenting will have their mics on. Thanks. To him, okay. would you begin again? Okay, I mean, we'll yes, continue uh, and we'll have a, yeah. a, a, a minute and a half left. Oh, no, yours is 10 minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I will restart. So the total process of this destruction starts in 200, uh, 2015 while an MOU was signed between DPDB and Reliance uh, in July 200, uh, 2015. Initially, Reliance had a vision to contribute uh, 3000 megawatts in the national power grid of Bangladesh. So uh, they have proposed two other projects, including this one, uh, which was 1500 megawatt CCPP, a combined cycle power plant in Chittagong and an FSRU in Kutubdia. However, both of them are um, in very preliminary stage and FSRU or FSRU government is not interested to build uh, another FSRU because we have already two right now. So in 2016, LOI has been signed uh, with Reliance and uh, in 2017, it got site clearance. Uh, in the year, uh, in this very year, I mean in 2017, Reliance approaches this project to FDB funding. And in uh, 2018, they uh, approached this project to JERA. Uh, for partnership and uh, Samsung for EPC contract. In 2019, the agreement was signed among Reliance, Jera, Samsung, and uh, the land trading starts. Currently, in 2020, the construction is going on, and we are unlikely enough to have another dark fuel power plant in Mughal. 
So this is uh, not a very uh, new power plant. However, the entire power plant is just a garbage uh, repacked in Bangladesh. Initially, Reliance had a plan to ship one of their gas turbine to Indonesia, but uh, and then they approached to Bangladesh. And finally, uh, a full set of eight, uh, seven, eighteen megawatt uh, CCP has been transferred to Meghnagar, Bangladesh, from Samalkot, uh, Andhra Pradesh, India. So we become a nice host uh, to an old power plant, like a glass of old wine in a new bottle. So what uh, it can be uh, done with our communities, uh, public consultation is completely denied. First of all, this project uh, is out of public consultation. Nobody from the nearby countries has any information about it. However, our Meghna, mighty Meghna River is already turned black due to previous three power plants and 26 industries in Meghnagar. Reliance will make the water darker. And one very day we will find the fishes and other aquatic animals in museum only. So the construction uh, is going on right now, but still we don't find, uh, find any uh, kind of GRM and uh, translation of uh, project brief. So the construction site is highly polluted. Uh, we have measured uh, PM 2.5 and PM 10 uh, in, in 2019 and 2020 uh, by this year. And our observations say that we have found eight to 10 times more uh, PM 2.5 and PM 10 uh, particle uh, than the optimum level in the construction site. And uh, this uh, whole uh, island historically was uh, used for grazing the, uh, for the landowners and the local communities of eight different villages, which have been diminished now. However, the uh, construction site is, is still under grazing practice and ESA admits it, but nobody is get compensated yet. So uh, it, it will be another economic burden for Bangladesh. This project uh, will carry a huge economic burden for this country. Currently, Bangladesh government is paying around USD 2.1.21 uh, billion per year. Uh, to the private power companies for their ideal power plant in the name of capacity charge. For this particular power plants, we have to pay 40% of this uh, plant load factor, which means we have to pay around $363.6 million per year. So uh, Reliance will recover their entire investment within four years without producing a single unit of electricity. And finally, the cumulative impact, which is uh, not concerned to anyone, is like an integrated uh, approach of uh, dumping coal without uh, concerning others. So in 2022, Meghnagat will dump 7.1 megaton of carbon from its five power plants only into the atmosphere of Dhaka. And uh, if we uh, look around this area, uh, Meghnagat already lost its 98, 90% uh, of uh, its green space in, uh, from 2002. Now it has only 11% greenery, which will be lost very soon. Uh, for Dhaka, it will make the situation worse than ever. And uh, uh, for the air pollution in pre-monsoon and post-monsoon period, April to September especially, it will contribute okay. significantly to mm -hmm. dust mm -hmm. particles and mm -hmm. heat as the uh, air will uh, blow on northwestern direction at this same time. And uh, uh, we are running fast uh, to be oursed. Someday we will permanently win the first position as the most polluted city on earth. And Reliance will be a good ally on this because it will surely contribute its bid to convert our capital city, Dhaka, into a carbon dump here. Thank you all. Well, we will give you a run for your money, even though there are a crazy amount of projects around Meghnagat and actually around many, many vulnerable coastal regions in, um, in Bangladesh. Um, I think a lot of us are in the race to take that number one spot. Um, but somebody who can um, tell us not just um, about uh, the impacts on communities, but about the, 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 um, the kinds of entities pushing these kinds of dirty projects onto us. 
and uh, and seeing that our governments actually uh, you know um, bend their uh, backbones very very subtly subtly and subtly from some of us and not so subtly sometimes um, is the our next speaker he will um, actually tell us more about reliance and what it is uh, up to because remember this um, reliance is not the big brother but the small brother and uh, not many people are very interested in this entity but I think it'll be very interesting for us to understand um, the younger brother and his um, companies better and what he is doing in Bangladesh. For that, we have a very eminent political commentator, a journalist, author, and documentary filmmaker from India. His work spans print, radio, television, um, and film, of course. Uh, he's also guest faculty member at a number of top educational institutions like the Indian Institutes of Management, the University of Delhi, JNU, the Asian College of Journalism, and Jamia Millia Islamia. He's hosted the chat show India Talks on CNBC India, which ran over 1400 episodes. So really he's a lumbe reska ghoda. He has written um, a number of articles and books on fossil fuel industries, media, media and democracy in India. He's taken on the Adanis. He had to um, uh, step away from the EPW that he, um, uh, you know, he, he steered at that time. Uh, that was written about quite a lot, but today he's not going to talk about um, uh, pet peeve Adani. He's going to talk about Reliance and um, he's written about the Reliance group. Paranjoy Guha Thakurta, we're so pleased you could join us today. Um, and yes, the mic is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Vidya, uh, for uh, inviting me to speak on this occasion. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Janab Sajad Hassan Tuhin. Thank you, Janab Mehdi. So I thank all of you for giving me this uh, opportunity to speak. I see a number of friends here. Uh, and Tuhin, you'll be very happy to know that uh, I uh, live in the national capital region uh, of India. Uh, and I, I am number one in the race. I mean, we are way, way above, ahead of Dhaka as the pollution capital of the planet. You know, uh, you know it's just... a that during the COVID uh, lockdown period, things have improved. Having said that, let me, I was lucky that a little before this conversation began, I was able to access some information about uh, the Meghna Ghat project. So I can add to what has already been uh, said by Tuhin. Now, as you know, once it is established, the Meghna Ghat 750 megawatt gas-based independent quote-unquote independent power project would be the largest in Bangladesh. Now I'll tell you a little bit more about the companies behind it but it would rep it was supposed to represent but we are not slightly unsure as I will tell you why it was supposed to represent the largest foreign direct investment from India to Bangladesh. And it was originally meant to reduce the debt burden of Reliance Power by about 116 million US dollars, which works out to roughly 835 crore rupees. And this money was payable to the Export Import Bank of the United States of America. Now, uh, if you look at the sequence of events, how did it all begin? In June of 2015, the Prime Minister of India and the Prime Minister of Bangladesh, uh, Narendra Modi and Sheikh Hasina, they met at Dhaka and a MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, was signed. But it wasn't until more than three years later, on the 31st of August, that finally an agreement was signed between Reliance Power on one side, Japan's JIRA on the other side, and Bangladesh BPDB, which is... Uh, the Bangladesh Power Development Board. Now, the way it was working, <coughs> as Tuhin was already pointed out, this was the, supposed to be the first of a series of projects which would eventually lead to the establishment of 3,000 uh, 3, megawatts of gas-based, what they call combined cycle 
uh, power project in, in phases. Now, there were three separate agreements. And now it's very interesting to know what will happen to these agreements because the deal is no longer what it used to be. The first agreement was a, a power purchase agreement and a land lease agreement with the Bangladesh Power Development Board. The second part of the, the second agreement was a gas supply agreement with Titas Gas, which is a subsidiary of uh, Petro Bangla. And third, and this is the most important part of it, was what is called a, an implementation agreement, which was signed by, with the, rather, the Ministry of Power, Energy and Mineral Resources uh, in, in Dhaka. And it was supposed to be implemented in three years. Exactly three years was the implementation of that. And at that time, if you recall in September, uh, when it was signed on the last day of August uh, 2019, uh, soon thereafter, on the 3rd of September, both Mr. Anil Ambani, the chairman of Reliance Power, said that this is going to really boost the economic uh, growth uh, and, and industrial growth of Bangladesh, and it will enhance the enhance uh, uh, um, enhance the energy security of the uh, of the of the country and lead to clean, green, and renewable LNG or liquefied natural gas-based power. And at the same time, a similar sort of statement came from Satoshi Onoda, who was the president of JIRA. It has been pointed out by Tohin, what was being given to Bangladesh was really a relocation of a model which was all, all of uh, power equipment, which was already at Samalkot in Andhra Pradesh. Now, a little bit about JIRA before I talk about reliance. JIRA is uh, was set up in October 2015. It is an alliance between two major Japanese power utilities. One is the Tokyo Electric Power Company and the other is the Chubu Electric Power Company. And together, this entity is one of the largest uh, power supply ent entities in Japan. And uh, the entire, and they, they deal with the entire energy supply chain from procurement of fuel, to the generation of power. And, and it has, uh, in Japan itself, it has invested in about 26 power projects, a total of about 67 gigawatt or uh, 67,000 megawatt. And, our, and, and in addition to that, there is an additional 10,000 megawatts or, or almost 10,000 megawatts or 10,010 uh, 10 gigawatt of installed capacity outside Japan. And let me suggest something here. In a way, what has happened may actually be good for Bangladesh. Because Reliance has virtually withdrawn from the project. Officially, it will still have its shares, but the entire management and implementation has now gone to the Japanese. Why did this happen? Essentially because Mr. Anil Dhirubhai Ambani's group, of which Reliance Power is a part, has gone broke. It is bankrupt. Let me explain what happened. Once upon a time, the Reliance ADAG, and you must uh, have uh, separated the two because the older brother uh, is Mukesh Ambani and the younger brother is Anil Ambani. Anil Ambani is 60 years old. Mukesh Ambani is two years older than him. Now, their father, uh, Dhirubhai Ambani, died in, on the 6th of July 2002. He died intestate. That means he died without a will. So then what happened was there was a big fight among the brothers and finally the mother had to mediate and intervene. And after this fight, which was out all over, it was out in the open and everybody was sort of saying terrible things about the other, the mother mediated and then they arrived at an understanding. The assets were divided. Mukesh Bhai uh, got uh, petrochemicals and petroleum and polyester and Anil got power, financial services, telecoms, but now telecoms is part of the Anil group. Why did this happen? Because Anil Ambani's group slowly but surely started going down. It could not repay its loans. So from being a leading private sector generator of coal, uh, based on coal as well as uh, gas and renewables, it, it once upon a time, remember Anil, uh, the, the group, Reliance Power Group, <clears throat> used to have an operating portfolio, which was almost like 6,000 megawatts, 6 gigawatts, like 5,945 
to be precise. But now that number has shrunk. I don't know the exact number now, but it is really in a very, very bad shape. Why? Because it is not able to pay its debts. Now, let me give you two or three examples as to why it happened. Uh, firstly, Anil Ambani, 12 years ago, used to be like his brother, one of the richest men in India. In fact, he was the third most, his brother was number one, and he was in the number three position. And because, because after the division of the assets, his net worth in one year had tripled, had trebled. But then what happened is, you know, he had a series of high profile projects. Uh, one among them was with Stephen Spielberg and his movie making company, DreamWorks. Then he got into controversy after controversy, including the one uh, with the uh, French aircraft manufacturer Dassault to, to uh, make the, uh, um, uh, to, to uh, have a, a local manufacturing of the <coughs> Rafale aircraft, which has become a politically very controversial project. Now what has happened is, how do we know that Anil Ambani is bankrupt? I'll give you three examples and then conclude. In March 2019, the Supreme Court of India directed Anil Ambani to pay roughly 80, bill, 80, million, sorry, 80 million US dollars to the Swedish telecom equipment manufacturer Ericsson. And the Supreme Court of India told Mr. Ambani, Anil Ambani, that if you do not pay up, we will put you behind bars. At that point of time, his older brother's son was getting married. And if Bloomberg is to be believed, he literally had to beg the older brother to bail him out. The equivalent of about 600 crores. Once again, according to Bloomberg Quint, he uh, surrendered. 299 year old leases for two very, very um, big office buildings in downtown Mumbai uh, to pay this loan. So what happened after that, his troubles didn't get over. Uh, in March of this year, a London court, a judge, David Waxman, he told Anil Ambani's group, please play the equivalent of roughly 92.5 million US dollars to three Chinese banks. These were CDB, ICBC, CXM. In 2012, a company called Reliance Communications and another company, Reliance Infratel, they had uh, borrowed this money and they were unable to pay it back. And what did his lawyer tell the court? He says, our client's net worth is down to 9 million. Whereas his total liabilities are over 300 million. So effectively, he is bankrupt. So the judge says, but he has his private aircraft. He has his fancy yacht. His older brother helped him out. And uh, when Ericsson wanted the money, so why don't you go back to your older brother? So the lawyer said, no, no, it was a one-time uh, settlement. And, and we can't give this money kind of again. On the 22nd of May, the UK court ordered that he pay up this money within 21 days. Uh, and the whole issue was, whose guarantee is it? Is it a personal guarantee? Or is it the guarantee of the company which Mr. Ambani is being asked to pay? And he said, you immediately did deposit $100 million. I do, do not know whether he'll be able to do so. Uh, but Anil Ambani claims he signed within courts, and lawyers will understand what I'm talking about a power of attorney limited to executing a non-binding letter of comfort to these banks. But the judge is saying, no, you are personally liable. It's a personal guarantee. Now, Mr. Anil Ambani's group has a similar problem. 1,200 crores is being now asked for by India's biggest bank, the State Bank of India. On the 18th of June, they asked for this money to be paid. And this matter has gone to the National Company Law Tribunal, and it may go up to the Appellate Tribunal. The same story, personal loan, personal guarantee, or corporate loan, corporate guarantee. So in so you way, have half a minute to wrap up. And I'm over. So in a sense, Bangladesh might be better off with the Japanese rather than Mr. Anil Ambani. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Well, it's very clear that in the guise of trying to help out Bangladesh, um, Anil Ambani is trying to help out his own uh, fortunes. And really, Bangladesh doesn't need any help. We all know that, um, you know, just last year, uh, their GDP growth levels were 8.2%. Um, and COVID might have brought that down, but not very far down. This, um, even poverty has decreased from 44% uh, in 91 to 13.8% in 2017. Um, but let's go on to um, Adani, shall we? Um, you know, uh, somebody we all love to collectively hate, I think, uh, while um, those in power still uh, are quite cozy with him. Um, the Gota power plant has been well documented. Um, Abir has also, um, the, our next speaker after Sridhar, who will give us the whole uh, project and what it can mean for the people there. We also have um, a young journalist, Abir, who works with Paranjoy, who will tell us more um, because of his many uh, trips to the place um, and his uh, articles that have been well read across the globe. Sridhar now is a geologist from IIT Roorkee and uh, managing trustee of Environmix Trust. He has worked with mainstream exploration organizations, the Atomic Minerals Division the government of the Government of India and ONGC. He is a founding executive member of the National Green Tribunal Bar Association. Sridhar Ramamurthy is currently also the convener of the um, International Committee of the NGO Forum on ABB, as also the, um, uh, you know, a co-group member of the Asian People's Movement on Debt and Development. Sridhar, on Adani. And Sridhar, you have begun screen sharing right away. Okay. Uh, Mr. Adani and his uh, company, the... Uh, Adani Jharkhand Power Limited is uh, building a power plant in uh, the Goda district of uh, Jharkhand, which is adjoining Bangladesh. And this uh, great Adani ripoff is, uh, you know, bringing coal from the indigenous or Aboriginal lands in Queensland, uh, taking it to, uh, you know, the Abbott Point port in uh, in Australia bringing it to Adani zone port in Dhamra uh, in Orissa, then lugging it to Goda in Jharkhand, producing power and transmitting that power to Bangladesh. So this is the biggest brainwave that they have thought of in terms of ripping off money everywhere and also you know, kind of uh, creating a lot of problems for people across the world. So these are some scenes uh, in Goda, like how they uh, started putting up their board, fenced the place, people protested. Some of these people are those people who were, uh, those who are uh, now filed the cases on the uh, land acquisition, which was uh, irregular. And uh, this fourth girder was uh, laid uh, now, you know, amidst the lockdown, so you can see whether uh, it's the pandemic and the lockdown, uh, it doesn't apply to Adani. Uh, and uh, he had been going on and now very recently, you might have seen a wonderful short uh, video that uh, Carbon Copy had made and I'll share that after this uh, meeting also, uh, which showed, uh, you know, how uh, the uh, Adanis have uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, continued work during this period. Then what is it that, you know, uh, the real problems right on the ground, apart from the fact that this was a land where in the 1800s, the Adivasis of that area, the Santalis, uh, fought hard and uh, what was called the Hul Revolution, the Sido Kanu brothers were killed in that process. And uh, the British realized this and brought on the protective law called the Santal Pargana Tenancy Act, where no 
Adivasi was allowed to sell land to anyone, any outsider. And even if they had to sell between themselves, they had to approach the government and inform them. But, you know, this law was diluted and then you know, they sought a, uh, opinion from the Advocate General who gave them a favorable kind of a letter to start the land acquisition. So, the land acquisition is one major kind of uh, irregularity that has happened in this case. The other one which I have been pursuing very closely along with our legal team, the Legal Initiative for Forests and Environment, has been the process of granting the environmental clearance. The project site, you know, uh, is uh, not according to our contention was the project site was not according to the siting guidelines, which said that if it is fertile agricultural land, you will not use it. But this was fertile agricultural land. They had no permission to withdraw water from the local river. The pre-feasibility report said that they will take water from the Ganges, but the environmental assessment said that they will take water from the Chir River. They provided, uh, they said that they will import coal from Australia, Indonesia, but not knowing what the quality of the coal would be, they had already predicted what kind of air pollution would be there. And they had not even disclosed what will be the mode and route by which it will be. The, uh, the fuel will come to the plant. But despite this, the uh, environmental appraisal committee started uh, processing it. And uh, the, uh, the EIA Resource and Response Center, which is a joint uh, initiative of life, uh, environics, and uh, peace institute, uh, we had uh, raised this issue uh, way back in uh, 2016 when the appraisal process started. As the appraisal process was going on, they went on uh, to give various kind of answers every time. You know, they said uh, they they are going to do the uh, the baseline study despite the process, despite the terms of reference not being granted, saying that. It will be at their risk and its at own cost. And the committee also agreed that if it is going to be at their own cost, as if in these cases, the government or somebody else gives them money. But it just said the committee agreed for the same at the you know, project proper and zone cost. So without applying its mind on numerous aspects, the uh, what the appraisal committee started focusing was on the the water, whether water was available or not. So we we went on pursuing the whole issue of water, and they they persisted that they were going to take water from the Chir River. Then what what was uh, very very crazy was when we proved that there was no water in the Chir River, they said that you know uh, they would make a big uh, reservoir, pump water during the uh, monsoon period and store water. And how, how will they store? They will make a 441 acre reservoir and which will be, you know, like one meter bund will be connect, uh, uh, created and they will fill water and store water for it. Then we proved that, you know, even that would not be sufficient because there will be evaporation and uh, then they said, you know, they will put up, uh, they will put up uh, solar panels on top of that uh, 441 acres of uh, uh, reservoir. When once we proved that was also not possible, and then it was actually requiring a much larger reservoir and you know uh, allow for a lot of evaporation. In the meantime, they had approached to take water from the Ganges. So though there was an intention to take water from the Ganges, which the pre-feasibility report had hinted, they had just dragged on this idea of a Chir River simply because you know they wanted the process to go on. Otherwise, the right from the beginning, there would have been big hue and cry as to why Ganges water is being given for this project. So now, you know, as a fate accompli, now a lot of things have happened. Now give us water from the Ganges was a was a ploy that they had played in this. 
and what what has happened you know at the time of uh, and in uh, 2017 the clearance was granted and then we went to the court uh, to the green tribunal almost immediately challenging this environmental clearance From one minute the, yeah huh? one minute so since then you know it dragged on what what is now essentially uh, the situation is on 3rd of august the green tribunal has asked them to answer several questions that we have raised and has also said if they are not able to answer why the work should not be stopped so that which is our prayer saying that you stop work so that we can solve all these problems so let us hope on the third day we definitely know that they don't have answers for it but we also know that they are powerful enough to do other things crazy things to enable that and i'll just run through rest of my slide saying that sepco uh, is the epc contractor the boiler technology is from babock and Wil wilcox in beijing the turbo generators are from general electric and this is an example of how you know uh clearances are granted for him the forest rights uh, you know issue is an important thing in india but when it came to the railway line it says uh, that you know it is making use of the relaxation and linear projects and therefore uh, you know this forest clearance is given and if you see they said that projects of their kind should be kept away from it and what has happened is uh, the cerc Uh, in 2018, said that Adani Power and APP it's clarified that the generating so ex exclusively to any particular independent shall not come under the scope of this regulation. So you find that you know the regulations that are meant for everybody doesn't apply for Adani. So the list of scams is actually endless. You know from airports to seaports, from coal to diamond. You know someday you must all. Uh, listen to paranjay on that but uh, like a prominent ruling party mp here called subramanyam swami says that you know he calls him the greatest trapeze artist who's would winking the bank with his debts and let he goes scot free this is the latest uh, ravage of uh, adani this is the neveli lignite corporation's uh, uh, project where they became the mine development organization 2 years before the project even started they were given this rights and uh, so this is how you know adani is one of the three scrap dealers of 80s who have made it big in india the adani the uh, agarwal the anil agarwal and lakshmi mittal and many of them you know are uh, you know such big enterprises but i can tell you that you know uh one brick down this edifice everything will fall you know and uh, that is how these enterprises are and please you know look at the avas petition that we have put in along with the local communities uh, let us take out the bricks of this big edifice thank you very much thank you so much shridhar that was fascinating actually um and uh, because we are now rushing uh, with time i will ask abir das gupta to please give us his views on what is happening exactly at godda abir we can't see you yet Abir is an investigative journalist who's been working with Paranjoy and they've been focusing on the Adani Godda project. Abir has gone many times to the field and written uh, reports uh, from there. There you are Abir, we can see you. Thank you, thank you Vidya for affording me this opportunity and thanks to everyone who's joined us. Now Sridhar has covered in a, in his detailed presentation the Godda power plant project uh, in great detail uh, so i just want to sort of zoom out and look at the bigger picture in relation to the adani group uh, now i have been working on researching the adani group in a lot of close detail for over 3 years now in collaboration with paranjoy and i want to make a couple of remarks to understand how this company functions and 
what uh, activists in Bangladesh can possibly look out for. Now, uh, the first thing to pay attention to is how the Adani Group's uh, business model works, how they expand. Uh, and their main, the main attribute of this is vertical integration. Uh, they usually start from one core project, a uh, land intensive project, that then expands into ancillary segments. This is the case that we've seen in Adani's flagship business in Mundra in Gujarat, where they started from a port and uh, expanded that port complex into a special economic zone. Through that, they got into power generation and into logistics. And from power, they then expanded into coal mining and now into transmission. Now, uh, if the Godda project is seen through to fruition, then that to me suggests that Adani may seek to enter through the transmission segment into other areas in Bangladesh as well. Now, in India recently, Adani acquired the Mumbai City Power Distribution contract, for example, uh, expanding its transmission business. So this is all one possibility that can be considered. Now, the second point I want to make is the manner in which the Adani group approaches what it calls government relations or government liaison. Uh, this is something that was told to us, to Paranjoy and myself, by a person who worked directly with Gautam Adani, that the company has a specific approach to what it calls environment management. And the two prongs of this approach are to ingratiate itself among the relevant regulators and ministries in the different level of government and to target dissenting voices and those who raise questions. In India, this is a process that is obviously quite advanced. On the one hand, several of us uh, journalists who cover the Adani group and activists associated with people's movements relating to Adani projects have faced legal and other forms of harassment. Whereas on the other hand, there are numerous Indian bureaucrats and officials who have gone on to enjoy lucrative post-retirement positions courtesy the Adani group. Now, this is a trend that is developing in Australia as well. And this is something that, once again, uh, I would like to flag as uh, consideration for activists in Bangladesh. Now, the third, if one can call it that common element uh, that connects Adani's projects across multiple locations in India, in Australia, also in Indonesia, where it is involved in coal mining and in palm oil, is that in multiple instances, the uh, indigenous communities are affected by the Adani Group's projects. This, of course, ties into larger global trends. But in Adani's case, if we look at how resistance campaigns have developed uh, across these locations, indigenous solidarity and community action has played a central role in organizing movements that question, uh, focus on questions relating to energy and the environment. Now, this is the case with the Godda power plant. The people's movement in Godda that has arisen uh, has been powered by an Adivasi or indigenous people's organization. This is, of course, the case in Australia as well with regard to the Carmichael coal mine project. Uh, now, in the past two years, I think we are beginning to see possibilities, growing possibilities for collaboration between the different people's movements in India and Australia with multiple different stakeholders coming together around opposition to this uh, project. And I, I think it can only bode well for such efforts for voices from Bangladesh to be brought forward into the mix. Uh, in February of this year, I visited Godda to speak to the communities that are affected by Adani's power plant. And these are detailed in reports that were published by Adani Watch in Australia and News Click in India. Now, as Sridhar detailed, the plan here is for coal mined by Adani in Queensland in Australia to be shipped over 10,000 kilometers to Godda in Jharkhand in India and for the power there to be export, generated there to be exported to Bangladesh. The campaign in Godda has focused on the question of land acquisition, on the question of the expropriation of land uh, held by members of the community under conditions that they have challenged at a number of different forums. Uh, one thing that I'm, the people that I met emphasized was that uh, when they asked government officials that 
uh, why is this uh, project being rushed through in this manner? They were told that it serves a public purpose and that, uh, that thereby the land acquisition process was justified. And when they asked what is the public purpose that the project is serving, since it isn't going to be supplying power to uh, the state of Jharkhand or anywhere in India, they were told that it's a part of a, it's a subject of a deal between the governments of India and Bangladesh. Now, as we know, this is a project that uh, it appears uh, is a subject of close personal interest at the highest levels of the Indian government. Uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, uh, in a visit to Australia, uh, flagged this project as a crucial co uh, component of India's bilateral relations with Australia. And the deal in whereby uh, Bangladesh was chosen as the buyer of Godda's power was also one that was done by Prime Minister Modi uh, with the Prime Minister of Bangladesh. Uh, now, what I'm suggesting is that uh, if a clear voice arises from civil society in Bangladesh, raising the question of whether the country really needs this power supply from Adani's plant in Godda, this can uh, bring about a change in the calculus of the various stakeholders. And as it has come together, as of now, the entity that benefits the most from the entire deal is the Adani group, not the com uh, community in Australia or in India or in Bangladesh. Huge subsidies are being provided by the governments, by all three governments involved. And uh, financing for the project is also one that the governments appear to be attempting to influence the process. In one case, of course, famously, uh, the chairperson of the State Bank of India promised a $1 billion uh, credit line to Adani for this project uh, that was announced while uh, the Prime Minister and Gautam Adani and this chairperson, Arundhati Bhattacharya, were in Australia. And uh, there are various other measures by which we can come to the same conclusion. So in that context, I see such a meeting as a very promising beginning for uh, dealing with a company like Adani that operates across borders in the entire region. Uh, public action and activism must also be based on an internationalist spirit. And with that, I thank uh, Mehdi and uh, Vidya and everyone else involved in bringing together this Indo-Bangla Energy Dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Abir. Uh, thank you so much. Um, yes. Um, um, Paranjoy had said he wanted to come in for a minute. Um, Paranjoy, do you want to do that right away or shall we hear Maha Mirza first and then you get your one minute? Shall we do it uh, like that? I will be happy if I can just speak for exactly one minute because it's okay. related Go. to the Go. Yes. Okay, will you just put on the video, please, for me, uh, Vidya, or who, whoever is the uh, administrator, or the host? All right. Okay, thank you so much. I can't start the video because the host has stopped. Oh, it. you. Okay. Yeah. The back end uh, work, Prince. Prince works with Clean, uh, and he's doing the back end work. Ki ki. Okay. Okay. Hoi gachi. There you are. Okay, there we go. I just wanted a minute to add two points that were already made by Sridhar and uh, Abid. I mean, they, they've uh, one connection between the two, Adani and Ambani, which uh, we sort of missed out, is one of the reasons why the Anil Ambani group has shrunk in size. It's because it sold its largest kind of this power distribution company in the city of Mumbai. To guess who? To Adani. So there is a connection. So this is a, a BSES, which was earlier called uh, Bombay Suburban Electric Supply. So that, that was the Ambani Adani connection, which I wanted to flag. And I also wanted to add something which uh, uh, Tim Buckley of IEFA, that is the Institute of Energy Economics and Financial An Analysis based in Australia, he has added, you know, this whole argument being given that the coal would come all the way from Australia to Dhamra port in the East Coast, then go to Godda in Jharkhand and from Godda 
Africa, the, the power would go all the way to Bangladesh. I mean, the, the sheer logistics of it, the, tran the, the transportation costs, the transmission costs, according to uh, Tim Buckley, and he has done a lot of excellent research on the subject, renders this project not just unviable, it's bad for Bangladesh. And I'll, I'll explain to you why. He calculates that the price per kilowatt hour, that is per unit, could vary somewhere between five and a half rupees to six rupees. Now, if you look at the cost of renewables, today the price of renewables has come down considerably and might be somewhere around, you know, 60%, uh, 50 to 60% of this price. So if India actually has to export power to Bangladesh, it should be exporting clean energy, not coal-based energy, but renewable. That's the only point I wanted to say. Absolutely. And I think Maha Mirza will be very happy with your point right there. And I think she's also going to make similar points. Also tell us what the energy situation in Bangladesh is. Uh, does Bangladesh really need any more additional capacity? Um, Maha Mirza is an independent researcher and editorial board member of Shobhujan Kotha, a periodical on environmental and human rights in Bangladesh. She regularly writes on energy and economic issues in the national media there. And she's also uh, involved with the National Committee um, uh, that we all have heard of, of course, the Ma National Committee to Protect Oil, Gas, Power, Port, and Mineral Resources, um, commonly called just the National Committee. Maha Mirza is really Maha. You know, um, don't go, uh, go by her um, sweet demeanor. She is very, very lalchari types. Yes, Maha, you're on mute, and I know that's not what you want to be. Th thank yeah. you for uh, giving me this opportunity, uh, Vidya. It's a pleasure to listen to all of you, especially you know, Paranjada and Sridhar. And I got, uh, I also got to know so much about the Adani got the power plants in India and also the, the stories of the two brothers. So it has been a good session. So uh, I'd like to talk about what's going on in the power sector in Bangladesh. And do we actually need to import uh, electricity from India? And also, do we need to build all these coal power plants, which are currently under construction in Bangladesh, whether it's Rampal or Matarbari or Paira or the other uh, mega coal projects in Bangladesh? So uh, if you just look at the power sector master plan in Bangladesh, which was uh, published in 2016. And if you look at the electricity demand forecast in Bangladesh, uh, it's saying that Bangladesh will require around uh, 60,000 megawatt by 2040. And it's a huge amount of electricity. Uh, but I'd like to remind you that since 2016, the National Committee in Bangladesh um, uh, has repeated the claim that it is possible to produce as much as uh, 60 or 70,000 megawatt of uh, cheaper electricity only if you radically shift your resources from coal and oil and nuclear to uh, renewable energy and domestic natural gas. And uh, also, if you use your 500 kilometer of uh, coastal belt for producing onshore wind. And that data was um, supported by NREAL, uh, the National uh, Renewable Energy Laboratory, uh, that Bangladesh does have sufficient wind speed and as much as uh, 20,000 megawatt of wind electricity is possible to be produced in Bangladesh by using our uh, coastal lines. And if you look at the study done by University of Berkeley and Stanford University and University of Sydney, uh, they're all giving you a similar picture that there is enormous potential of uh, solar and wind in Bangladesh. So uh, it's not that a no coal position in Bangladesh is a position of the romantic pools who want to keep people in the caves. Uh, but it is, the, you know, nobody is saying that uh, we don't need electricity, but uh, it is the mechanism through which electricity is produced should be brought under uh, serious scrutiny. Uh, right now, the way the government is forecasting its electricity demand is definitely not uh, based on the actual demand of our people, actual demand of our uh, rural economy and our uh, local industries, but it is based on the demand which has been derived from this uh, very economic model that um, 
prioritizes uh, the building of mega projects only and which also facilitates the shifting of resources from local communities uh, to the hands of big business. Uh, but does it help the majority population of the country to produce more electricity? Does it really uh, help the low income communities? Uh, in this way, it doesn't because here you are ending up producing expensive electricity, uh, which your people can't even afford, as uh, Paranjada had pointed out. So if we closely observe the pattern of development in Bangladesh, uh, you will see an entire decade of development in Bangladesh has delivered a very high growth rate with no jobs. Uh, so it's a jobless growth scenario, just like India. And, and uh, there's no chance that in the coming decade, the country will industrialize rapidly and end up creating thousands and thousands of jobs because uh, the so-called uh, energy intensive development model that we have adopted, it's not designed to create jobs in the first place. It is not designed to alleviate poverty in the first place. Rather, uh, it is exclusively designed to ship local resources to big business, to international banks. And of course, the ruling party members were deeply connected with this uh, entire uh, mafia belt. Now, if you can show us a plan in which uh, you're going to produce 50,000 megawatt of electricity by using renewable sources, and if you can uh, show us that the electricity will be used for rural development, for rural employment generation, uh, for poverty alleviation, for lighting the remote areas, or for developing um, small and medium enterprises. Yes, that's exactly what should happen. But the problem is that their plan is exactly opposite of that, uh, because the government if you look at the power sector master plan, the government has targeted coal as its principal source of electricity, uh, and the government has already uh, planned to set up around uh, 29 coal projects, a total of more than 20,000 megawatt generation capacity, uh, and it's planning to expand its coal-based electricity from 3% to 35% in the next 10 years. So it's crazy. Uh, and second, secondly, Bangladesh is overbuilding its power sector. We have a demand of 9,000 megawatt of electricity right now, and we have an installation capacity of 19,000 megawatt already, as Vidya pointed out earlier. So we already have 10,000 megawatt capacity just lying idle. And by uh, 2026, we might just end up with um, almost 70% of surplus capacity, according to a prediction by IPA. So, you know, it doesn't make any financial sense that the Bangladesh government is locking our power sector uh, into expensive coal power plants. And this is going to create a huge huge economic burden in the system. Uh, and as you know, most Indian coal plants are using um, domestic coal, which is cheaper than imported coal, but Bangladesh will have to extensively uh, rely on the use of imported coal. And thanks to the successful resistance in the northern part of Bangladesh against um, open pit coal mining, uh, and in order to carry out uh, the transportation of imported coal, particularly from Indonesia, uh, now we have ended up building a massive coal terminal in Matarbari. We have ended up building the world's most expensive uh, deep sea port in Paira. We have ended up signing for a 240 kilometer uh, railway deal with DP Rail, which would cost around a uh, billion dollars. Uh, and the research by IFA has shown that in order to facilitate coal transportation to Rampal power plant, uh, Bangladesh government will have to constantly keep up with a highly expensive uh, dredging activity, uh, which will cost around $26 million annually. And it's, it's crazy expenditure altogether, and which is required just to transport coal. Uh, and all this expenditure will occur even before you start producing a a single unit of electricity. So that's the problem with you know, imported coal and imported LNG. We are spending so much on infrastructure in the name of development, but this kind of infrastructure has nothing to do with uh, development. Uh, so you know the National Committee did a calculation back in 2016, which shows that uh, if you go for imported coal and imported LNG and imported nuclear, uh, each unit of electricity will cost you uh, 11 taka. But if you uh, go for a combination of uh, renewable and domestic natural gas, it will cost you only five taka. So, uh, you know, it makes no sense uh, to build so many coal plants and terminals and deep sea ports and then in addition to that importing um, electricity from India uh, while having only a mere five to ten percent of your energy mix coming from renewable energy, particularly at a time when the cost of renewable energy is coming down so fast. Uh, so you're missing out your chance uh, to make electricity both cheaper and cleaner for your people and what is the result of it? Uh, the price of electricity has already been 
uh, increased eight times in last 10 years, and it's going to increase many folds uh, in the coming year. Uh, so as I said, we are producing expensive electricity that people can't even afford. Uh, so if you look at the Indian power sector right now, there's just so much to learn from the Indian mistakes because uh, first of all, India has a massive surplus of uh, coal-based electricity and you know, cancellations of coal projects are becoming so normal in India. And I think India recently had to cancel around 470 uh, coal power projects. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. And India has about... Um, 40,000 megawatts of coal projects, which are financially distressed. And thanks to Paranjada, because of his journalism, we got to know so much about the Indian coal sector and how it has created such a burden to the Indian uh, banking system. So you see, even the narrative is quickly changing. It is not about how much do we invest in a new coal capacity. Now the question is, how do we shut down uh, existing coal capacity in order to uh, minimize the losses? And in this context, I don't think uh, any logical mind can understand the Bangladesh government's uh, crazy persuasion of coal power generation. So, you know, we are following everything that is wrong in the Indian power sector and we are following and we're not following what India actually did right for its power sector and that is expanding its um, renewable energy sector with state subsidy because the share of renewable in our energy mix is only a mere 5%. That is, uh, that is like less than 500 megawatt of electricity, and that's a shame. And uh, today we are going for an energy intensive development model. We are overbuilding our coal sector, just like India. And instead of focusing on decentralization and rural employment generation, uh, we are focusing merely on uh, mega power projects, which uh, naturally involves all the elements of chronic capitalism, enormous money-making opportunities, Opportunities, enormous corruption, uh, enormous looting of taxpayers' money. Uh, so, you know, we should not only push the government to shift our resources from coal to renewable, but we should also talk about the bigger picture because coal is not our principal issue here. It's just a part of a bigger problem because if we eliminate coal, uh, high priced uh, imported LNG will replace the vacuum. If we eliminate LNG, uh, nuclear power will take over, Rosatom will take over. And if we push for green energy, they will bring uh, large corporations to build uh, big scale solar plants by probably uh, evicting farming communities. Uh, and we have seen this in the case of uh, Bangladesh government's uh, solar agreement with Beximco. It's one of the largest corporation in Bangladesh. Now they're trying to make some big money out of green energy. Uh, so how to stop them? So I just want to finish by saying that the problem lies in this hugely corrupted economic system of these two countries, which uh, thrives on this uh, unholy nexus between the banks and the business and the states and, and the ruling party members. And it is um, designed to shift resources from local economy to the uh, very powerful uh, rent-seeking elements of the economy. So uh, our focus should be really there. Thank you, Vivian. I think I was able to finish by 10 minutes. <laughs> yes, thank you, Maha. Maha had told me not to stop her and that she might go beyond time. But I think you made um, uh, very, very good points and right there on time. Uh, corruption and crony, uh, crony capitalism really having a vice grip on both our nations. And, um, and how, um, um, you know, um, we're not being good neighbors anymore, uh, even though we would like to project ourselves as being such friendly, good neighbors. I think this brings us nicely into um, the last project that we want to look at today. And um, this is something that everyone has actually spoken of and many of us know about. Um, it's popularly called Rampal, but it's also very evocatively called the Maitri Super uh, Thermal Power Project. And um, of course, India has a big role to play in this project and therefore it's very important to an uh, Indo-Bangla energy dialogue. Um, it has many important Indian players that are pushing the Rampal project, NTPC, Indian Exim, uh, BHEL, Price, Waterhouse, Coopers, um, and, and uh, it's all targeting an area that we both are so proud of. It's a UNESCO World Heritage uh, listed mangrove, Shundorban, uh, which means beautiful forest in Bengali. Um, to take us through this is another spirited campaigner, just like Maha, someone who is now doing it from afar because she currently lives in Germany. Uh, Tony is still passionately involved with the Save the Sundarbans campaign and works with Orgewald, a German NGO. 
Earlier, she was involved with 350.org, ActionAid Bangladesh, and BRAC in Bangladesh. Uh, Tony Notion is now a global climate justice activist, and we're very happy uh, that she will take us through um, the Rampal project um, in, with some details. Thank you, Vidyadi. Um, it's a bit also intimidating to be presenting or talking about Rampal because, as you said, like everybody knows, it's a big iconic project, and also my involvement with the project is much, um, maybe many of you are for sure involved with the movement for much longer than I am. I got involved with it from 2016, more actively, of course, when I was in Bangladesh, I was part of the movement, but uh, when we, uh, in 2016, when we turned the movement into a global um, campaign, that was also when I started getting um, heavily involved with Trample, but um, I will just, uh, of course, for the sake of it, also share quickly a bit of the background information, which most of you also know, and I'm also sure there would be many things to add on, because as I was saying, it's a big movement, there has been many different actors, and it is one of those, now it's uh, for nine years that uh, this, um, uh, the movement against Rampal Coal Power Plant is going on, or Maitri Thermal uh, Super Power Plant, as its official name is. So I would just try to give a bit of to do because I know where everyone is at to kind of capture everyone to on the same page. I will try to quickly run through the basic information about uh, the Rampal Power Plant, Shundarbans, why we care, what why, why do we care if Shundarban gets destroyed or does it really get destroyed from Rampal? And then I will of course try to like most people would try to bring the conversation to the my area of comfort regarding the, the global campaign and now what we're doing in germany um against uh, fishnar um i will need to share my screen so um this is just a brief about rampal power project yes it's a my three it's called my three super thermal power project this is all the information that you can get also from the official project website so the land requirement has been 915 acres. It says, of course, imported coal and daily coal requirements when operational will be 12,000 tons. Um, one key thing is Indian Exim Bank is the main financier of it. And of course, there is NTPC, 15% Power Development Board of Bangladesh is 15%. So it's like a 50-50 joint partnership, but the financing is mostly um, done by the Indian Exim Bank. Um, the location, here we have a beautiful Google Earth picture where we can see why uh, we, what's the relationship between Rampal Coal Power Plant and Chundarbans, that the Rampal, this Tamil Coal Power Plant is 10.5 kilometers away from the uh, reserve forest, the UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, and also, yeah, so you, you get an idea why are we putting the connection between these two. And about Chundarbans, again, of course, a uh, table. <laughs> to put in some numbers to show you that, oh, we know what we're talking about to convince all of you that, okay, we are not just saying things. <laughs> we have done our homework and you see that, um, yeah, we have uh, endangered species as this forest, specifically uh, the Ganges and Iravati dolphin, but it's only, of course, not about the species or the animals. It's also, Shurbans is home to, uh, for livelihood for many people who lives around uh, the forest, uh, livelihoods depend on it and also from, um, okay, yes, we have some um, plants and animal pictures, but then this slide that I want to show you is, it's from a recent, the Amphan cyclone that um, uh, just uh, happened like last month that took place and hit, uh, of course, uh, West Bengal and Bangladesh and this is taken from this uh, website where it was tracking, you could track the um, cyclone and it shows the wind speed. And you would see that drastically for, so the purple is a higher wind speed, something as something around 70 MPH, and then the orange um, uh, is uh, goes down to 30. So we see suddenly it looks like at the border of Bangladesh, the wind speed is drastically re getting reduced. And what is that? We don't know, but we know that's actually the Shunarvan. So because from this map, you don't see what's this invisible thing that's drastically reducing the impact of the, um, the this cyclone uh, wind speed, but yeah, that's the coastal forest. So that also elaborates why it's so important for us, especially when Bangladesh is going to be one of the most uh, uh, impacted countries from uh, the climate change. So we will, we will have more frequent uh, cyclones and also the sea level is rising. So at that point, to destroy a forest, that a coastal forest, a mangrove, that literally acts as a barrier, natural barrier and livelihood for so many uh, natural uh, species and humans is very counterintuitive. But then is it really going to kill the forest? I mean, why do we say that, oh, um, the Rampal Parpan will kill the forest? 
what is the deal? Okay, so the deal here we can see from this data is taken from uh, Bangladesh British and the Loan and Government Pension Fund of Norway, a joint study uh, from report. So this is just the projected emissions uh, that the Rampal uh, Coal Power Plant, once oper operational, uh, will emit. And just try to create some, because we, we humans, we are not very good at numbers. We need some kind of um, reference point on what does it mean. So kind of then we, it tried to also create some reference points. Okay, this would mean 7.9 million tons of uh, CO2 would mean equivalent of cutting 340 million trees. Um, there are these tons of small particles that would end up uh, resulting in lung diseases and water and earth pollution. So we get it. Okay, there will be a lot of pollution. Um, so IUCN mission report, uh, IUCN, uh, there was a specific in 2016, uh, because uh, Shunrabansi is a world uh, UNESCO heritage site, there was, a, and, and uh, so there was a team coming, visiting, and then they, they this report that they gave, there were four uh, key concerns that they raised. Um, of course, so there will be pollution from uh, coal ash by air, there will be pollution from uh, wastewater and waste ash that will be um, getting dumped, there will be increased shipping and dredging, uh, the, because the coal would be uh, brought to uh, the, the run of coal power plant uh, through um, ships, uh, through the rivers, and then of course the cumulative impact of industrial and related development infrastructure that's going to take place. So Rampal is not only this one thermal uh, power plant, but there's also this whole industrial area which is plan being planned to build to reuse the, the, the ash and the coal um, uh, waste from, so there's some cement factories that are planned and it's like the whole industrial complex that's um, going to be built. Um, so uh, this is also another just to make it visual because we are never good with uh, just words and numbers. So this is uh, from cases from Dominican Republic and US that the coal ash disposal, what impact it could have. So these are um, direct impacts on human. Sorry for making you, um, yeah, look at this distressing images, but just to put an idea of what we were expecting to deal with. And so as this was clear, so from 2011, when uh, this power plant was, this agreement was signed the, um, uh, between India and Bangladesh government and its resistance, um, it started from the right, like from the very beginning. I think this is also one of the most beautiful thing about this um, resistance that it started right from the beginning when it started. And it, at the same time, it's very unique because it was the first kind of the coal power plant, but it started in Bangladesh, like the, before the movements, it was always uh, in case of the Fulbari um, coal uh, uh, resistance, like the open pit coal mining resistance. It was uh, people, it, it was, uh, it would have displaced around 200,000 uh, people and taken away a, a large uh, amount of land that is used for um, uh, crop uh, growing rice. But with the Rampal Thermal Coal Property, it was a lot about Chunderbans, the forest. I mean, of course, it was also about people being evicted. But this whole discussion around why we don't want coal and the importance of protecting a forest and at the same time as uh, Mahapa was already discussing before that it was not only about coal but this whole questioning this development model this what do we prioritize and how do we have to do this compromise against because the government uh, reaction was first that oh we need to provide food for people and job for people we, we cannot afford to protect the forest and from the movement side the argument was like we don't want to be choosing between environment or development. We want a different kind of development where we protect both and one cannot go uh, uh, except the other. Or one of the slogans, the most popular slogan I um, think was became in, in the Shunarbans movement was, um, there is alternative to coal, there's alternative to uh, energy, but there is no alternative to uh, Shunarbans. So this, I think, is fundamentally different or unique was also in the history of Bangladesh movement, because of course we have a very rich, history of resistance from the, from already from the British, like uh, from the last 200 years, Bengal has always been a very active or rich ground for resistance. And in this way, um, of course there was movements against like, the Chipko movement in India, but it was in a different part of India. So this way, in terms of environmental movement, um, in my limited, like this, what I've encountered and read, I think that's why also this Rampal Kolkata movement is unique. It kind of makes this um, point um, specific um, case. So here we see the movement was very big. Of course, this is one of the picture from a uh, big mobilization in Pulna. Um, uh, uh, and there was a huge long march people. In one of the long march, there were over three, three days, 5,000 people walked uh, more than 500 kilometers. And over this time, more than 30,000 people participated. So we see that this movement really became big. And, and if it was really like an um, operating or acting um, democracy, there is no way this power plant, this project could still go ahead, considering how many people, like the, the, the general consensus against this power plant and 
there were, we know, pregnant mom, I mean, Mahapa, and, and most of you already know maybe, but I could say even better that there were moms who were pregnant doing sit downs with their toddlers saying that I don't want this uh, problem to go ahead because I want my kids to be able to breathe in a, in a, in a country in, in Bangladesh where there's still fresh air. So there was all, all people from all walks of life came together to protest. This is also, this is just to show like how artists also join in. This is also a beautiful picture to show this, to capture this concept of people, animals, everybody like bonding together to resist. Um, yeah, this is also amazing. A, um, the logo of the, the, um, this movement kind of like Bato Shunurvas and you see the tiger that greets Shunurvan in Bangla. So this is also uh, Mika Mahdi. So these are all, all these artists and activists voluntarily worked and produced the beautiful amount of uh, art, song, and there's, yeah, the songs, of course, I cannot present here to you. There's been um, uh, plays uh, being done, songs being written, stories being generated. So this has been a beautiful, colorful movement in that sense as well, like where you see everybody coming together and using all kinds of tools to, to express the, uh, the, the, the concern and of the dissent. Um, as I had a glance, of course, this is like the one which happened, demonstration, there were open letters sent to the Prime Minister of Bangladesh and India. There were uh, more than uh, exactly 12 expert reports that was also shared with the Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina in 2017. So it's not that they don't know. There has been, uh, Amal already also said there were very expert reports and at the same time what uh, was also the, um, the alternative energy plan. So it was from the movements that was not only we are just saying no to everything that you say because that was also something government was saying, oh, you always say no, but then what, what, we, what is your plan? And then we said, hey, okay, we also have a plan. Here is our plan. So this is a um, comparison uh, that I just quickly present. If you want to look at it, it's also available online. Um, the, the National Committee of Bangladesh uh, that Vidyadi already shared with you, NCBD, uh, prepared a, a completely volunteer, the volunteer team worked on this. Uh, Mahamir Mahapa was all part, one, uh, a part of that volunteer team. There are also amazing researchers who are um, part of this, uh, preparing this power plan. And here you see that what the alternative is being proposed is actually even better than the government wants. So in terms of the um, long-term goal is 2041, the short term was 2021. And here, um, uh, of course, activists also talk about using the natural gas. That is uh, a local essay is a transitional fuel. Um, and uh, what the point is that we don't need, because a lot of the argument also comes, oh, you need coal, Bangladesh needs coal as a bridge technology. And this is also that we can clearly say, no, we don't even need coal, not even for a bridge technology we need it, because even for that, we can use natural coal that we have locally. If we have to use, if we must use, we can use it. It's 50% it's less um, carbon intensive than coal. It's cleaner. And if you produce it uh, within our local capacity that we have, our, our government, BAPEX, this um, energy uh, 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 board, uh, they, they could produce it. Uh, they could extract it and it would be also much cheaper. We don't need any kind of international multinational company involvement. And of course, this is one of the reasons probably why this is never an option that's considered because there's not much money to be made or kind of the cronies that, um, that has been discussed already. Um, yeah, so there is no big business opportunities here. So also you see other uh, in terms of the cost comparison, uh, it's much cheaper and, and this uh, 12.79 uh, that uh, according to the um, NCBT solar energy plan will be 5.10. And besides this NCBD's alternative development, there's also a, a, a beautiful, detailed, very technical report by Bread for the World and uh, Coastal um, um, CPD. Um, I forgot the name of the... Um, so there were these two jointly produced uh, report that shows that it's already possible to uh, produce 100% renewables for Bangladesh in the next 50 years, just with planning, and it, it's going to be cheaper. So. Even not this. Uh, even if the, somebody wants to defy this uh, um, plan because it's it's from the movement, so there's also very technical uh, and different kind of reports that also exist. So what did we get as a response? Of course, uh, amazingly, uh, police brutality. Now, Tony. Tony. Uh, say again. We need to wrap up now. Tony. How how long do I have? Uh, you're out of time, but half a minute. Okay, Ooh, that will be difficult. Okay, then, so there is, hmm. so there's, of course, the police okay, brutality. Okay, we'll give already... your voice one minute. Okay, I mean, maybe a lot of the people talk over a bit, so I will take uh, just a bit more quickly. I hope that's fine. So this okay. is, yes. Yeah, so I won't stop know. a woman talking okay. because we need more South Asian women talking. Otherwise, it's only the men who talk, talk. Yes, so you talk. I'm glad. 
Thank you for the solidarity. So um, yeah, so here's the some some of the police brutality that we know that we received in 2016. It got so it was very difficult to continue being mobilizing on the streets inside the country. Um, so this is just to give a quick look of the upstream actors, and the financing that's coming through Exim Bank India. There's also uh, one I can see in here. This is Standard Chartered Bank also is financing uh, Ram Paul directly through uh, Exim Bank, um, and of course the Fischner, the German company. And now I'm just was going to arrive. So quickly, so of course, then from 2016, we started to mobilize globally. Um, we have been to the UNESCO World Heritage uh, Committee meeting, and then um, it was in 2019. So we have had very different civil society. Uh, we have gotten support from different international civil society as well, and also international activist group. We have had a global day of protest from Bangladeshi diaspora in 2017. This is the 2019 World Unit Heritage Committee's decision that clearly says that all our scale industrial infrastructure should go ahead and it does not make any exception for the Rampal Coal Power Plant. Um, and now we have this Stop Fischner campaign in Germany that we started because Fischner is the chief engineering um, consultant farm that is constructing Rampal Coal Power Plant. As we see at this stage, that this is the leverage that we have from abroad because if we can create enough pressure, it's a German company, it's uh, involved with this very controversial project. And while Germany tries to look, oh, we are being responsible, we're moving away from coal, but there are still companies, international companies making money from coal businesses. And kind of from this point, we have been able to mobilize, connect a lot of, so this is a um, poster from this action we did last uh, month in front of uh, Fischner's uh, office. And you can see how many different activist groups we could also mobilize from, a very um, left interventionist link is from a very left to uh, young greens, also like quite liberal, um, moderate uh, group. So this is also one of the unique things of, of, of this campaign in, in Germany that we see that under behind this campaign, there is a, a large different number of people. actors are coming ahead. And here, just some pictures for you. And yeah, this is also from this uh, German coal, Germany, coal mine in Germany, where we did this action recently to send solidarity and kind of share that make how it full screen. Make say it again? Full screen. Ah, okay yeah so just just yeah so then the the, the idea was to, the, the idea that we're pushing ahead that even inside when the country it's becoming difficult to mobilize and how we can still create pressure globally by connecting with different actors and kind of mobilizing and this we can use also a good example of global solidarity to also extend that it's the one fight because all the companies, they are united in their businesses and money making. So what we need more and more that the activists join hands in our resistance as well. And I finish, thank you. That's it. Yes. Thank you, Tony, um, for also giving us a glimpse of that inspiring fight um, that has taken over the imagination of the world to conserve our um, um, shared uh, heritage forest. Um, next, we have someone who has been part of this um, fight. And yes, before I forget, I must tell you that Jyotirmoy Barua has actually shared the National Committee's um, uh, you know, web page where you can see um, everything that Maha and uh, Tony have spoken about and that wonderful energy plan, which is of course much better than the governmental plan of coal, LNG and nuclear. Uh, and much cheaper too. So a more sustainable plan uh, you can find there. Meanwhile, let's go on to um, somebody who will respond and really he's the best person to respond to a presentation um, uh, from, uh, from a Bangladeshi on Rampal. Uh, Soumya Datta um, stays on this side in India, is an Ashoka Fellow and renowned environmentalist. He's also co-convener of SEPAC, one of our, um, you know, co-hosts today, uh, the South Asian People's Action on Climate Crisis. An environmentalist uh, as part of the movement for advancing understanding on sustainability and mutuality, mutuality, which they call MOSAM. Uh, he's also part of the Bharat Jan Vigyan Chapa and the India Climate Justice um, Network. Somia is uh, an advisory board member of the UN Climate Technology Center and Network. Shomo Datto, who is really, I think his heart is in the Sundarbans and in um, all these movements in Bangladesh that hope to conserve it. 
Shomo, the mic is yours. Thank you, Vidya. Thank you, everyone uh, who presented before me. Uh, my uh, involvement with Rampal struggle started in late 2014, early 2015, when um, there were some big conferences in Dhaka on Sundarbans. Uh, different uh, groups organized uh, conferences, discussions, and I was invited to speak on uh, basically energy and the relationship between energy and uh, development. Uh, then I participated in the 2016 long march and even beyond. We went to the Rampal site, talked to lots of people, maybe 200, 250 people, local people all the way. So uh, I'll be presenting very quickly because Tani's presentation brought in a lot of this uh, Rampal issues and Maha also presented on the energy issue. But I'll add some points which have been missed out. Uh, one of the major ob objections by both the Bangladesh and Indian groups, activist groups, environmental institutions, is to Rampal is, it's not only a question of carbon emission. Uh, Bangladesh carbon emission is not a very major factor compared to the global. In fact, uh, globally, we burn around 7.56 uh, billion tons of coal. This will be adding uh, another 5 million tons of coal. But the major impact will be on the Sundarbans. And the, apart from the factors that Penny said, there are very critical factors. Like she mentioned about Amphan. When Amphan hit West Bengal, uh, they, Amphan destroyed 10.5 lakh houses that is one over one million houses in west bengal park only in three districts but since it had to of course the speed went down because also of landfall cyclone speeds reduce on landfall but another big factor was the friction the friction coefficient of the sundarbans the forest which was uh, not which was totally denuded in the area that it hit in the west bengal so bangladesh really didn't get huge impact from one of the largest cyclones, cyclonic storm in the last century, 100 years. Amphan reached category five stage at one point. So this also gives us the importance of Sundarban, but how does Rampal connect into it? See, if you are building a big coal power plant, which will be emitting anything between eight million tons of carbon dioxide, some sulfur dioxide, there'll be a huge amount of acid, which is called acid rain, which will be coming down with the rains. And the mangrove forests are very sensitive to the pH value, to the dissolved oxygen, to the water temperature. So if you disturb this balance, mangrove forests die out. This year in January, I was in Indian Sundarbans in eight islands in a big uh, science outreach program. And in February, I was in the Bangladesh Sundarban with Mehdi and all. And we are finding this uh, crisis one after the other everywhere. And then at, at that point also, I mentioned this. And then in May 20th, Amphan hit. So if you are bringing in one big coal power plant, one big coal power plant will not destroy Sundarban. But we have already seen by holding the hand of Rampal, there are a large number of industries, coal forging units, cement plants, everything is going ahead because the land is available, power is available, connectivity is available, and water is available. The second thing is the coal power plant don't only uh, emit a little particulate and uh, uh, carbon dioxide. There will be mercury. All coal contains mercury. Mercury is a neurotoxin. And the uh, danger of mercury as a neurotoxin is increased if that area is a wetland, which the Sundarbans area there is. And all of us probably heard about the Minamata disaster in Japan. This will be a much larger scale because the mercury, when it goes into uh, water bodies, then it, there is a chance of turning into methyl mercury. And it goes into the water body means fish accumulate. Fish is bioaccumulator. So all the pollution, the Rampal coal, uh, the uh, basin, coal ash pond is situated right on the Pashur River. The barges that come in with coal and now the barges that come in also with fly ash from India, there are regular barge sinking incidents happening in Bola, Pashur, Sela, all these rivers in the Sundarbans. So the acidity, the emission, uh, pollution level in the rivers are going up and fish being a very large resource for livelihood and protein source for Bangladesh, millions of people in that area, probably three to four million people depend on this kind of livelihood, forest resources access and fish, fish access, catching fish. So if you are actually allowing the entire fish resources to be poisoned, because as I said, fish is a bioaccumulator. So anything that is available in the water at a low dilution will be concentrated in the fish. And when the people eat those fish, it will be even more concentrated in our bodies. So we are in fact allowing the poisoning of all the human bodies that will be consuming the fish from there. Plus, we are allowing the poisoning of the water resources, changing their pH balance, their dissolved oxygen, 
because when huge amount of hot water warm water is being dumped dumped will be dumped into poshur river the do the dissolved oxygen will go down apart from many other changes and that also creates huge problem for aquatic animals and aquatic plants the entire aquatic life chain will be collapsing and that we have seen in many other places we have done work in mundra in the extreme western part which is close to pakistan on the other side so oh, but tata mundra and adari mundra what devastation they have caused so there will be a massive impact on local population and this local is not only rampal but apart from that today when we when i visited along with an india team 2016 the rampal site mongla port and the uh, region around there is a huge number of people whose livelihood still are reasonably well carried out by catching crabs and the crab is a very the large crabs that are available and there is a huge number of wetlands small ponds medium sized ponds all these will be poisoned when you release so much of fly ash so much of uh, bottom ash and fly ash is dumped there and so much of coal dust so that whole area will be completely poisoned sundarban mangrove forest will start to get degraded fast and then over a period of time mangroves there will be dying out that sign this time in february visit Mehdi showed me also, and he also talked about there are already mangrove dieouts happening because of other industries. So this will be magnified many, many, many times. But let me quickly come into because many uh, the question of whether Bangladesh, though I think this has not been addressed fully, whether Bangladesh needs Rampal or similar power plants. Uh, Maha talked about, Anni talked about a little bit uh, about the availability of electricity. But I don't don't think. you can compare if the comparison of megawatt hour to megawatt hour is not exact comparison electricity doesn't give you pleasure just by being there electricity is a service electricity is an enabler all kinds of energy is an enabler we have to see what electricity and energy does to human beings how does it uh, comp- how does it complement human development and in that you will see if bangladesh's goal is to improve the living standards the human development index of bangladesh population look at sri lanka with roughly 60% of electricity consumption of india sri lanka's hdi today the human development index today is 0.776 it's in the high development category india is 0.64 it is in the medium development category with almost as a 65 67% extra consumption than this bangladesh with one less than one third the electricity consumption of india today per capita is already at 0.61 so there is a, there are other routes of human development where you don't need to destroy your protective sundarbans where you don't need to spoil, uh, poison the livelihood of your millions of fish workers fish uh, fish farmers and fish catcher both capture and culture fisheries there are two kinds of fisheries that is practiced in that area capture and culture so both this will be devastated so that's not needed the other point that bangladesh government like the indian government and several others is not looking at is that over the last 15 16 years the amount of energy needed for a certain amount of uh, even gdp gdp is not a very good indicator but even this crude indicator of gdp if you want to create extra 1000 dollar gdp how much energy you need to give we are all still using the 1970s model and those 1970s economic calculation if you see in 2003 India used roughly around uh, uh, 190 kg of oil equivalent to create every thousand dollar of GDP. Today that is 90, less than half. In China, 231 was the figure in 2003. Today it is 120, half. So throughout the countries, throughout the world, if you see the amount of even GDP creation is today requires half or less than half. of the energy total energy because electricity is a part of total energy basket primary energy basket so bangladesh today should not look around the worst look towards the worst example bangladesh should look towards the better example other reasons being bangladesh is one of the most congested most high high population density countries india has around 420 bangladesh around 1200 so if you are destroying your livelihoods your land your forest protective forest the sundarbans protect something like 3 uh, crore people from uh, cyclones and storms and it's not only the wind because people talk about the wind when a big tropical storm comes there are three components which damage uh, lives which damage property and infrastructure one is the high speed wind second is the storm surge third is the heavy rain so both the first one 
the high speed wind and the storm surge forest particularly mangrove forests which are very dense are very good at slowing down at uh, reducing their impact so if you are going to have a major amount of power power electricity from coal at a very high cost and also at a very high economic cost forget about the environmental and social cost even the economic cost is uh, i think close to uh, 6 rupees what rampal has been earlier uh, calculated so this is complete stupidity complete madness there are very good ways not only renewable over a uh, period of time i know all of the all of you talked about bangladesh has indigenous gas domestic gas gas until you move to more renewable and that every kind of power every kind of energy extraction has an impact there is nothing called zero impact even renewable has an impact renewable has a land impact bangladesh being very congested you have to also go for uh, innovative models like agri voltaics you can't give it like uh, companies in india are doing give it a huge amount of land to developers so that they cordon off the land in the name of solar parks that cannot be done in bangladesh as it should not be done in india but there is three times the reason not to be done in bangladesh because the population density is almost three times and intensity of land use in bangladesh is even more than in india because of the uh, dependence on agriculture and land dependent livelihood land means land water forest dependent livelihoods so the intensity of land dependence in bangladesh is far more than even in india and in india it is far more than in many european countries american countries who don't understand these relationships very well so uh, i think there are ways very clear ways but i said in even in the economic term there are very clear pathways for if you want to develop your population develop their standard of living develop their qualities of life if you just want to even de develop your gdp even then this uh, rampal and coal power plants are very bad investments in terms of economic investment these are very bad investments so i think i am uh, out of my time uh, with the so i'll uh, end here and i'll be yes, happy to can. answer any question thank you thank you somyada and now it's question time there are plenty of questions and some discussion that has happened um, as we've um, had the panelists speak um, remember we are open to more questions we have half an hour that we've allocated for uh, uh, Q&A. Um, but we are hoping that through the Q&A, we can also think of ways forward. Uh, so please feel free to either mention the speaker or just put a, a general question that will go to all speakers. We'll begin with the first presenter. Um, so Tuhin, there was a question for you. I think um, it was from Ryan Hassan of the NGO Forum on ADB. He says, uh, ADB categorized Reliance Bangladesh LNG as category A. Um, that's, you know, the, the, a kind of project that will create the most problems. Has there been any communication with the ADB in terms of environment impact and displacement issues from national groups is his specific question to you, Tuhin. Would you take that? Yes, thank you, Vidya. Uh, that was a very nice question from Ryan Bhai, but uh, I can say that we are in a very preliminary stage right now. We're just assessing the impacts uh, from the community and the environmental impacts of the site. So till now, we are gathering information and definitely we will go to ADP uh, in future. And I, I just wanted to add one more point to Shammada. Uh, his presentation was really nice. And as a forestry graduate, I can uh, add one uh, impact of a Sundarbans due to this uh, commercialization. Uh, the sheep and Poshu channels, we have a patch of around 190 square kilometer of forest. And in last census, we found only two tigers in that large amount of area. So the impact is now on. So thank you. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. But yes, I'm sure that there will be communication with the ADB on, um, uh, you know, the fact that it's a Category A project and there are ramifications of that on the ground, Ryan. Meanwhile, for Paranjoy, um, there was one from Farha from Kashmir who asked whether Ambani or Adani are having uh, plans for future projects, which you've actually answered, haven't you, Paranjoy? In the, um, you've said you're not so sure as the situation 
um, is still far from normal. Yeah, absolutely correct. Uh, if you will recall, in September uh, 2019, immediately after the government of India uh, wrote down Section 370 of the Constitution of India, which gave a special status to the former state of Jammu and Kashmir, and then it was divided into two union territories. Uh, at that time, immediately after that, a large number of uh, business groups, including Adani and the older Ambani, said, yes, we will start projects over there, we will build hotels, tourism is a major uh, employment generator and uh, uh, an industry in Jammu and Kashmir. But there was supposed to be uh, a meeting which never actually happened. Uh, they said, yes, uh, the government will give some special concessions. On the contrary, they're opening possibly mining leases. And especially after what has happened uh, in the last uh, few weeks and months, the military standoff between India and China in Ladakh, uh, my personal view is that uh, the situation is at least will not be perceived by the Adanis and Ambanis of the world to make major investments in in the Kashmir Valley in particular. This is my personal view. Okay, Varunjo, you have another question, but I think I'll first give Sridhar a question and then get back to you. Um, Sridhar, are you with us? Yes. Um, there's a question from Asha Ramesh. Uh, she's an independent gender activist and consultant in India. Uh, I am interested to know if anyone has, do, has done or is doing a study on the impact of such projects on the most marginalized communities, especially women and children. And uh, together with Sridhar, somebody from um, uh, you know, Bangladesh, I think Maha, you could also come in on this. Yes. There isn't a and, and if I may briefly intervene, Vidya, I have a suggestion. This is a good time since now it's open. Why don't you uh, let us see everybody who's uh, available? You know, I mean, who's absolutely. Who's... Please, uh, all of you could turn on your videos, not so much your mics, please, but your videos. Ashok ji, Malu, um, Arun Singh, Nibedita, Saswati. Uh, Jyotir Moy has already turned on his video. So um, even as people do that, Sridhar, um, yeah. can we have uh, your we, thoughts? Yes. Yeah, we, we don't have any specific study, you know, like uh, on uh, Godas, though we know what kind of impacts it has been. And there are some, uh, you know, reports, you know, you could have seen uh, uh, one of the, you know, videos where women are actually begging or you know, telling the uh, Adani officials that, you know, uh, leave us, right? Uh, so, uh, but, you know, there is no, not been still a very specific study of what the impacts have been for the community in a, in a formal sense. Thank you. I think um, uh, before Maha, I think even Somyada was raising his hand that he wants to respond to this, right? Somya? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, we did a study in Tata, Mun Tata uh, and Adani Mundra area in Mundra in Gujarat. And uh, there were three, four very clear impacts that we found women and children. One, because of, and you know what Gujarat is, because of the huge, initially, the huge influx of outside uh, workers, migrant workers, alcoholism went up there. And as a result of alcoholism, a lot of local uh, people also started producing alcohol and families got tremendously impacted. The family violence there imp increased tremendously. That, that was one very clear impact. And the local women's group there, led by Rina, Rina is a rabari, uh, they actually took it up. They had to raid some of these alcohol making uh, units, a lot of these things happened. The second impact that we found within three, four years of this power plant coming in is on children. The doctors, local doctors, of course, everyone was very afraid because the Adanis were there and uh, people were really not willing to come out. But after three years of effort, two and a half years of effort, some doctors opened up and they clearly said their data is showing within three years of Adani Mundra and Tata Mundra opening up, there is a 20 to 22 percent rise in their upper respiratory tract diseases of children, the children below six, seven. 
and that is a very clear data that is showing and this is not only children this is the elderly also but since you asked about women children but the elderly are also a vulnerable group the third response that we thought very critical impact on marginal livelihood holders we have seen is on pastoralists because all the pasture areas were covered with both old dust and coal ash no, fly ash so there were immediate increase in the abnormal abortion and abnormal abdominal disease of cattle so as a result tatas and adanis were forced to arrange fodder in fixed areas they said you bring your cattle to this fixed area we will provide fodder by truck loads because lots of cattle were dying but it's not one or two it's by 100 they were abnormal abortion and abdominal disease and they were dying same thing happened with the sapota uh, plantation once this came in the entire area and this was a small area with sweet water rest of the area has uh, salty ground water so there was this small belt where agriculture was possible the entire sapota plantation was wiped out because all the fruits were having black spots and those are not sellable so there are many others the salt panas in this area the particularly the small salt panas who were roughly 3000 in that area their salt was being contaminated with fly ash and coal dust so i can go on and on and on we have documented this in the real cost of power the report i wrote in 2012 uh, you can see that this must be in the online available online but there are multiple impacts and we have seen the fish farmers about uh, something like 6 to 7000 fish uh, fish workers there their income reduced to around 40 reduced by around 40 to 45% within 4 years so they are now really stressed to uh, normally coastal fish workers are not very poor if the she is undisturbed if, uh, then they are not poor because their catch is very very remunerative but they actually became poor people so this you can see go and see any day this has happened within the past four years of those power plants operating and they this struggle is going on and i end with this there is a report then that was commissioned afterwards done by one uh, gujarat group uh, we had this idea that what are the total impacts on children of that area so this gujarat group has done this prakash chakos group somebody of you might know him they have done a small study on impact of children of this coal power plants thank you actually asha since i know that you live in bangalore now even closer um, to you in udupi where there's an adani uh, power plant a coal fire plant very very similar case that have been documented in some detail through testimonials and given to the government the karnataka state government and also the court uh, i can share all of that with you we found almost everything that shomo said uh, absolutely the same thing on the ground Uh, I think Shridhar wanted to say something. Yes, and meanwhile, do look at Swaraj Das from um, People's. Um, what is it? Papa People's people Project Affected People. Project Affected People's, people's Association. Association. Yes. So he says no more coal. Yeah. Yes, uh, Shridhar, your mic is on. Yeah. Uh, no, I I was just responding to you know if there was a specific study in Adani. like shomya da said the entire thing about uh, mundra uh, our own studies whether it has been in raigad korba or angul uh, we have found many of these impacts in fact one of the studies that we found you know and which is uh, you know it is happening across the entire coal belt and uh, very well documented in angul has been the problems of unwed mothers there are you know in a very very short study you know we uh, in a in a period of 100 days just from information from one of them telling about an experience of another we could trace more than 100 people in just 30 days so you know there are several impacts on women and children but i was only responding to the fact of there has been a detailed study done in godda and uh, i think we need to do that thank you thank you thank you uh, maha do you also want to uh, answer that or uh, can we go on hmm. you have to unmute yes uh, um, of course there are some studies i think um, there is a specific study 
well, not really a research. I think there are some reports on uh, Matarbari coal plant and uh, you know, more on the eviction of people and, and, the, comp and the corruption in the compensation process and, the, and the, uh, the current status of the labor rights over there. I think Ajad Bhai will be able to uh, tell this. Uh, you know. And I think there's some reports on Rampal and one was done by uh, Abdullah Harun Sar from Khulna University, uh, more on the ecological impact on Rampal. And I think uh, Sharif Jamil Bhai is here. He probably would be able to say on some reports on Cox's Bazaar and you know, some of the um, prediction which has been made uh, in the imp impact of coal plants on the coastal belt in Bangladesh. I, I can give you the links afterwards. I can't uh, recall right away. Okay, thank you. Uh, Paranjoy, there's a question uh, that I'm putting to you. Uh, Siddharth Akali from CHRD, which is the Coalition for Human Rights and Development, uh, asks, um, asks about the foreign lender pressure on Adani, including divestment, especially in the current economic crisis. And also, are there any strong opportunities um, building the, uh, opportunities for strong opportunities building up there, uh, especially in the context of a lot of their newer investments being long term in terms of returns and considering that the group is highly leveraged and with a high debt pile. It's a very, very good question. But the answer is not a simple answer. It is not today, but for several years now that the Adani group has been highly leveraged. And it has always been able to get additional loans. Now, when you have a situation where you have, you're not just close to the ruling dispensation. Uh, very few people knew of Mr. Gautam Adani 15 or 20 years ago. Today, if you believe Forbes, he's the second richest man in India. His conglomerate has expended at breakneck speed. And, and the speed at which they've got into new areas every year, virtually every few months, so it's not just your areas which were traditional areas of his like coal mining, power generation, power transmission. He's very big in edible oils. He's very big in real estate. He's, he's big in importing apples. He's, his his uh, extended family were very big in, in, in diamonds and cut and polished diamonds. And now he's got into city gas distribution and into defense equipment, including manufacture of drones. And he's into data storage. Uh, I'm sure I missed out a few things. Not to mention all his interest in, in ports, in shipping, in, and, and, and um, the, the Mundra port. Uh, Abid will be able to tell you more about this. It's already emerged as uh, one of the biggest and soon could be, and I think has become the biggest, uh, the group has become the biggest container port operator in the country. So when you're expanding at such a a huge pace or such a fast pace and when you've got the ru ruling dispensation behind you uh, so banks and financial institutions are willing to give you more and more money so in a sense you keep wondering whether they're over with leverage and my friends in Australia have often asked me this question and so will will the bubble burst well certainly Mr. Adani doesn't think the bubble will uh, burst and I can't really predict the future as far as the Australia project is concerned and we have Adam Black over here who could perhaps add to what I'm saying. Uh, it was originally meant to be four times bigger than what it is. So in that sense, if it was meant to be huge and much, much bigger than it is, and because of various reasons, including the very active uh, movement, uh, civil society movement in, in Australia, that has been one of the factors that Adani's had to scale down that project drastically, which would also mean that his requirements for capital has come down. At the same time, we also see because of the global recession, uh, 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 the prices of coal have come down. And, and, uh, uh, and oh, I forgot to mention, Arani is also going to become one of the biggest operator of airports in India. So, so if, if uh, the price of cost of capital goes up, the price of commodities go up, it would be a difficult call to take whether that bubble will burst. We have Sridhar who has raised his hand again. Um, Sridhar, do you want to add something? Yes, uh, actually, you know, if you if we look at the Goda project particularly, uh, th they need an investment of nearly fifteen thousand crores, 
and the power finance corporation that is the government's own power finance corporation and the rural electrification corporation they have already agreed to give a loan of 10000 crores so when uh, you know it's not the indian banks or other investors like uh, the problem with lot of indian companies you know whether it is adani ambani or many of them the public shareholding is very little and the investments outside investments are very little and in india you know with this kind of leveraging that is possible the indian investors or the indian promoters bring in little equity lot of debt so here in the case of uh, goda uh, the only uh, difference that can be made is if the power finance corporation and the rural electrification corporation which directly take you know kind of uh, instructions from the central government if they are going to stop the investment only then it will make otherwise rest of the you know investments or other things are going to be marginal second is when they uh, ask uh, you know like uh, the sepco or any of the chinese uh, companies uh, to you know do the uh, epc contract they bring their own money along with it so you know uh, in that sense uh, most often you know the, the uh, promoter does not need uh, you know immediately to invest big money on that so now you know the question is if there are others outside of this there are very few and that is why that kind of a, a pressure investment investor pressure is very difficult to bring in the case of that I now have um, a couple of questions for those in Bangladesh, and here they are. Yes, uh, Maha Nakul from Kansa asks, what is Bangladesh's strategy to decarbonize their energy needs? Is there a political will to do so? And uh, Mehdi, if you could answer another question that Nakul has put out. Um, what about the role of mainstream telemedia houses in Bangladesh? Are these issues covered at all in prime time slots? Yes, both of you. Okay, um, can I say? So Bangladesh. You should, you should reply have... both of the, you should reply both of them both of the questions. Now, nah. <laughs> to me, the first question I will first answer. Maha. Hmm? Okay, no, uh, it, it's a very short answer because uh, Bangladesh doesn't have a plan to decarbonize. It has all the political, I mean, from the part of the Bangladesh government, it has all the plans to carbonize Bangladesh and to make Bangladesh a carbon bomb. Uh, though our political leaders and our, uh, you know, government officials and high officials, you know, go to different climate conferences and they talk about decarbonizing and talk about 100% renewable, but back home, it's a very different scenario. They, they do exactly the opposite of what they commit uh, in the international conference. So, yes, uh, they have all the political will to make Bangladesh, uh, uh, you know, a carbon bomb. So no political will from their part. Mehdi thank you, on. thank you. Yeah. Uh, I wanna, I wanna add a little bit with Mahapa first, and then, then I'll go to my question. One is Bangladesh signed several documents and also made several papers, uh, which uh, you know, uh, dear please Paul. Don't stop. Yeah. Uh, Mehdi. Yeah. Please continue. Okay. Uh, so one of the document is uh, uh, declaration of climate vulnerable forum uh, which committed to uh, uh, ensure zero uh, emission by 2050 uh, it's declared in 2015 secondly bangladesh uh, formed the uh, uh, endorsed uh, ndc national uh, intended nationally determined contribution to climate change while it uh, declared that it will ensure uh, Ten percent of renewable energy by 2021. Uh, the third one is it has several uh, uh, policy guidelines like how to install, how much uh, it will promote uh, the renewables, etc., etc. But all of these are paper tiger. Uh, second one is uh, you know most of the media, like other countries, most of the media of Bangladesh is also owned by the corporations uh, who are also um, involved with the uh, quick rental or rental or independent power plants. Uh, so may, uh, the news 
in prime time is very low but sometimes if the movement is big really big then they cannot cannot avoid that uh, news also that is the reality thank you thanks mandi bhai and uh, maha thank you with the the answer of my query thank you um was someone trying to say something then you need to point me up acha um i think there are a couple of questions that can um, you know take us forward uh from action aid bangladesh there's uh, azad abul kalam who asks how can we develop a more strong cso alliance between indo bangla to stop rampal power plant uh, in particular he asks there's also another one um, from nakul from kansa saying what would it take for all regional csos in south asia to demand a blanket ban on fossil fuel power expansion and financing what kind of campaign anyone shomo is raring to go yes do unmute yourself for more no you are lot yes. of Fine. am i am i audible okay now the now you question, just unmuted yourself okay thanks uh, the first question lot of us have been grappling lot of other groups have been grappling there are several collaborative uh, uh, efforts which have been taken earlier but i think one of the major uh, the reality you have to understand that over the last few years particularly the 4 5 6 years the political situations in both the countries have drastically changed so the kind of strategies that we were adopting earlier we really need to change some of those strategies because earlier it was much more even though there were repression even though there were uh, suppression of dissent there were, it was much less now there are very strong attacks on this so i think we need to actually change strategies into where we have to find like the banks and financial institution flying leverage we have to also find leverages where comparatively little uh, external effort can give us more we can talk that in detail but i think this change of strategy is one very important area the second i think the demand that somebody uh, said that blanket ban on all fossil fuel expansion will be very difficult because even in bangladesh energy plan gas plays a very major role in india it is very low in india the gas con contributes 5.7% of energy Uh, in bangladesh it contributes uh, around uh, 60% of the total uh, primary energy basket at roughly don't take the exact figure and uh, almost 68% of the energy generation uh, so right now demanding a total ban on fossil fuel will be difficult but the uh, a phased uh, tra transition plan is a must so i think we what we should press our governments for is a clear phased transition plan with clear timelines and how are we going to do this transition from fossil fuels first coal we have to prioritize phasing out coal first and foremost that has to go very fast and then to uh, oil and gas in india oil in the power sector oil don't play much role in bangladesh it still play a very big role with dirty oil there's heavy fuel oil and all they play a fairly big role so those will be the secondary things but we have to instead of right now demanding a complete ban on fossil fuel we have to ask for a phase plan phase out transition plan with clear timelines exactly a phase out transition plan with clear timelines if if such projects are still pushed at bangladesh and even india that transition yeah. plan will go all india on. yes paranjoy i just india. want to add to what shomo uh, shomo doctor has said and i can see swaraj das holding his uh, badge saying no more coal we i mean i think civil society uh, activists and those who are concerned about the environment have to keep in mind what is realistic and what is achievable i don't think for instance the government of india is going to give up coal altogether and if any of you are interested in details on why this is so i can send them did many articles have been written the point that has to be mentioned as shomoda said a transition greater emphasis on renewables greater emphasis on cleaner sources of energy including gas and uh, lng and 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 uh, other forms of gas 
But more importantly, when there are coal mining projects that are being undertaken, the environmental impact assessment, hearing the people who are the project affected people in the pandemic, the government of India has sought to rush through a draft environment assessment, uh, a new environment impact assessment uh, notification, which has absolutely got people very, very angry, very, very upset. If you do not consult the people who are, whose land you are taking, whose, uh, whose habitat, whose you are destroying, and if you cannot think of ways in which to engage with them, then these projects are going to create more tension, more inequality, more social tension. And, and I think that is uh, something that has to be kept in mind. That, that's all I, I wanted to just by way of a brief intervention. Thank you. Um, Sridhar, I'll give you the chance, but we'll just also go into the question that Nivedita has um, asked, and I think she had asked um, it of Maha especially. Yes, that sustainable development has become a cliched platitude these days. So what do you suggest to actually break through this impasse? And um, Maha and Tonni, as young climate campaigners, energy activists, um, what can you bring um, to, you know, break this um, impasse that even Paranjoy talked of? Sridhar, I'll come back to you. Yes. Take the question. So how do you break the impasse where, um, uh, you know, this whole talk of sustainable development has become just a cliche? It's all destructive development being pursued by both our countries and uh, foisted on each other also. Maha, are you there? I think Tony would be able to better answer this question. She's okay, in the degrowth okay. campaign. Yes. She, she even climbed up trees and puts up Save the Sundarban posters, etc. So yes, Tony, how do you break this? Um... As Mahapa was saying, there is also this whole degrowth movement that's forming globally as well, trying to kind of question the whole main mainstream narrative of development. So the whole idea is asking, taking the idea of development and turning its head around this whole development that we know and that are, we are being told that, oh, there are some early industrialized countries and which path we are all to follow. And we see China and India has done very well in this way, but at the same time, we see more and more that the inequality inside India is also heavily rising. So even though India is one of the leading countries uh, in terms of like the biggest, one of the largest emerging economies, but in terms of inequality and the standard of life, the average Indian people um, has is getting even worse. And there are even cases, there's Amartya Shen did, this, did his book um, three years ago where he took case study of Bangladesh and India, where he questions that why in terms of human development index, Bangladesh does much better in even in terms of the sustainable development goals than um, India. But then the question now we also generally, the economists are asking is even within the sustainable development goals, it's not enough anymore because we see that we cannot provide a good life for all within the planetary boundaries, even if we try to follow this whole sustainable development goal. I think in that way, of course, what you said, this whole impasse, it's first thing to address that how the sustainable goals are being used to greenwash and kind of, and from there, it's always important to come to the point of system change, the discussion of we cannot be like, so the, the battery, the, 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 uh, the electric cars are not going to solve our problem or also what uh, Shomoda was already discussing that we need energy and people need energy, but to what, in terms of what are the examples do we take? So what kind of lifestyle we take as an example of uh, what we provide for people's energy and that would mean that's a good lifestyle? And can we also ask, turn that around and question that? And I think within each country, you would also see different kind of um, school of thoughts who are a pro and cons or like in favor of this or not. But I think it's time to get involved in those discussions as well and kind of stop and think, okay, so it's not only the fight at the moment, it's about on the energy sector, but it is not really only about the energy sector. We need to rethink drastically the whole development narrative and what means for good life all, for all and how we can get there. So I would say that is kind of the start asking the questions differently to break through that. 
in person. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Uh, Sridhar, you get one minute. We've already crossed 30 uh, with our Q&A. Yes. Yeah, uh, I, I don't even need a minute. I, I have a slightly different perspective than what uh, Shomoda and uh, Puranjai said. Uh, my point is no new coal or fossil fuel projects, number one. And I think in that, all of us can work together. Uh, you need not worry about you know, your uh, thinking about how the balance of different things will happen. I think we have excess power and therefore, you know, in either India or in Bangladesh, simply the slogan that no more fossil fuels uh, should work for everyone. So therefore, you know, let us not get confused there and say no more fossil fuel uh, power. So that is one. Uh, uh, second, I think that you know uh, the idea of sustainable development and what the UN has been doing is only to you know kind of uh, uh, sidetrack what are the big issues because in the in the uh, last several decades the whole issue of equity has been completely you know kind of moved out of uh, debate. Uh, the issue of self-reliant communities have been moved out of debate. So I think we have to question what uh, UN or you know, this whole sustainable development is talking about. And uh, of course, on uh, you know, the issue of uh, Rampal, I think you know, Swaraj Bhai would uh, be very keen on telling something about how jointly you can fight in the... Yes, yes. Uh, Swaraj, from Project Affected People's Association, you get your half minute. Swaraj. Swaraj. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Vidya. But this uh, video is not my video. Rampal Power Plant, when it started the fight, and when it was in Kolkata, we have started our project from that, our Project Affected Pupils Association, which is the work of Asansol, Ranigan, Durgapur, in the working class. Ke andar mein, so, uh, and affected pupils के अंदर में तो हम लोगों ने एक साथ में ये रामपाल के खिलाफ क्योंकि धरती को बर्बाद करने के लिए आमाजान और सुंदरवन ये दो बड़ा जो जंगल है ये दो जंगल का हमको बचा के रखना है और सुंदरवन को मतलब हम जिंदगी में हम लोग कभी भी एक सुंदरवन पैदा नहीं कर सकते हैं सुंदरवन को बर्बाद करने के लिए बांग्लादेश पावर प्लांट गवर्नमेंट का जो पावर प्रोजेक्ट कंपनी है और अपना इंडिया का जो एनटीपीसी है दोनों मिलके इसको बर्बाद करने का जो चक्कर लिया है उसमें प्रोजेक्ट अफेक्टेड पीपल्स पापा ने इंडिया में बैठ करके अपना देश का जो कंपनी है उसके खिलाफ हम लोगों ने बहुत सारे शमीनार अरेंज किए हैं हम लोगों ने रैली किए हैं मिशिल किए हैं इस सब सारी करके आरएस हम लोग बनाए हैं मेरा लास्ट जो सवाल ये है जो साथी जो भी गवर्नमेंट में पावर में आते हैं ना वो कॉरपोरेट सेक्टर से सिलेक्ट होकर के चुन कर ही गवर्नमेंट में आते हैं और गवर्नमेंट में बैठने के बाद वो ही कॉरपोरेट के लिए काम करते हैं हमारा देश में अदानी अभी इतना फलफुल क्यों गया तो आगे कहना बने गया अच्छा अदानी तार कारण ही होते जो अदानी का गवर्नमेंट दिल्ली में बैठा हुआ है और यही गवर्नमेंट का सपोर्ट लेकर के पूरा दुनिया में अदानी अपना घोड़े को दौड़ा रहे हैं और ऊर्जा मतलब नोंगड़ा मतलब डाटी एनर्जी पैदा करते हैं और पैसा उपार्जन कर रहे हैं इसके खिलाफ हमें एकजुट होकर लड़ना है नो कोल मोर ये स्लोगान लेकर के हम लोग मैदान में उतर गए हम सब एक साथ में एक साथ में सायोनारा कोल नो कोल मोर टोटल एग्जिट कोल यही डिमांड रखते हैं Great. Um, yes, that has to be the only demand, that there has to be a total exit from coal. And I think it needs to begin right away. Um, we've completely run out of time. We need some time for wrapping up. 
And uh, I'll give that over to um, uh, a lawyer from the Supreme Court in Bangladesh. Um, we know that we will strongly collaborate to end coal and fossil fuels and that we will continue to fight um, and step up the campaigns against Asia's dirty companies, uh, which include Adani and Reliance, of course. Um, Barrister Jyotirmoy Borua is one of the prominent advocates in the Bangladesh Supreme Court, working tirelessly to protect environmental and human rights, especially the right to speech and the right to land. He has been working as the convener of lawyers for energy and ecological rights, and also the convener of Life and Nature Safeguard Platform, LNSP Bangladesh, which is our co-host today for the Indo-Bangla Energy Dialogue. Jyotir Maida. Thank you, Vidya. Thank you um, to the panelists, uh, especially to the Paranjay Guhuta Kuratada, Sridhar Ramamurthida, Shomoda, Mahamidja, Tony Naushin, and Sajjad Hussain Sohin. It was an excellent discussion and uh, very enlightening. Um, and um, if I just uh, sum up very quickly in a few lines, uh, Paranjay Guhuta Kuratada enlightened us about the condition, financial status of uh, its reliance group and what we are dealing with basically. And, um, and Sridhar Ramamurthy that obviously took us to the uh, Goda project and uh, given us all the details. And I see many similarities. He talked about the Santal Pargana land preservation law, which is, um, a, which is in our uh, legal system, we have the same sort of protection for the Adibasi land that they cannot in alienate or transfer their land to any other community other than their own Adivasi community. But um, these um, investors and the government uh, in both the countries, they know how to avoid these laws and they make their new tools to avoid these laws. And I think the same thing is happening in Tarkand for the project. And um, if I come to Shomoda, Shomoda gave us really an excellent insight which we have been uh, saying uh, from different perspectives in our Bangladesh as well that we cannot create another Sundarban. Sundarban cannot be compared with any energy at all. I, I seriously, seriously go with Shamuda on this particular point. And uh, if I come back to Maha, Maha gave us a really, really tremendously clear picture of the energy situation in Bangladesh. If I, um, if I visualize what uh, Maha said, is that in, in the next couple of years, probably we will be drinking energy, we will be eating energy, we'll be doing everything with the energy because we already have surplus of 50% energy we don't use. Basically, we are wasting this. And no um, government officials or any authority has to answer this. This is, the, this is another thing we are seeing that no one questions their uh, uh, actions of wasting this much, much of public money. This is same thing happening probably in uh, in your side of India. Um, they are wasting our resources. They are wasting our energy in the name of uh, this energy. They are giving permission to new coal-based power plants again and again. 29 coal power plants already on the pipeline. So. Uh, there is no accountability at all. And when we raise these questions, in, in most of the uh, cases, especially in Rampal, India is responsible for uh, implementing Rampal. So um, if you consider the slogans the National Committee had, go back NTPC, go back India. This gives an, a wrong um, perspective as well. This, this gives a wrong perspective in the sense that the people of Bangladesh probably agitated against India. No, this is not the case. I would like to make this point very clear. The member secretary of the National Committee, Professor Anna Muhammad said, and he says this to, um, repeats this in, in his almost every um, energy talk, um, that hesitating against India does not necessarily mean that we are hesitating against the whole state. We are hesitating against the decision makers, against the present government who are taking all these uh, wrong decisions, who are causing this trouble to us. But we need to collaborate more and more with our activists, our friends from both the countries to stop this project. And uh, if I use the term, all these uh, panelists and other um, honorable guests who spoke from their own experiences are the activists. 
but whom we are talking against the climate terrorists. So we need to collaborate more against this climate terrorists, basically, and all these corruptions and this um, uh, local resources transferring, shipping to the banks and other um, gra grabbers, national and international grabbers. We need to work together, we need to collaborate together. So I'm not going to take too long. Um, I'm just going to give you three specific um, um, announcements. One is, um, I have already uh, pointed out that we need more collaboration and this collaboration we would like to extend not only with India, uh, to China, Japan, Netherlands, and who, uh, whoever countries um, are investing in our country on energy um, projects. And we are planning to hold several other webinars in association with our activist friends uh, and from those countries to bring uh, all these issues up um, all together. And we strongly, uh, strongly urge you um, to stay with us, to be with us, help us in this journey. And we should work together on this. And the second announcement is um, from the working group, uh, we have um, already started uh, an initiative for Listen to Bangladesh, which uh, probably um, the Shoras, uh, Shoras the probably would be more interested in. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is the project, this is the plan we are uh, um, uh, starting now to listen from the affected people, to share their experience in, uh, in a greater audience. Um, there is a poll going on now, um, wherein we are requesting our friends to vote for the most important projects to bring about uh, for discussion um, by the affected pe people. You may find the links in the uh, chat box, and uh, please cast your vote and let us know your opinion, of which particular project you want us to uh, bring about uh, uh, at the moment. And uh, the third announcement is, um, we would like to take on the project separately to focus on the investors and companies directly to assess their contribution to the destruction of the environment. We'll come together again to protest um, Adani Goja Coal Power Plant project for the destruction and pollution of environment in India in the name of producing electricity in Bangladesh. We, uh, I, I, uh, so far I, I remember um, uh, Shomoda uh, raised this question whether with the big question we need first whether we need this um, Adani Goda um, coal power plant um, uh, to produce electricity for Bangladesh or not. While Maha said, if I just collaborate with this, this to uh, compare this to statement, well, Maha said 50% of the energy are wasted now. So why would um, Adani have to um, set up another coal power plant in um, Goda in Jharkhand to produce electricity for Bangladesh. This is absolutely ridiculous. This is completely ridiculous and I don't see, and from, from the activities, activist perspective from Bangladesh, we don't see any, any uh, uh, prospect on this project at all. So we don't need it. And uh, one thing uh, on the solution uh, bit I would like to add is um, if you check in the chat box, I have shared our LNSP website. Um, on 30th of November last year, we um, held one uh, public hearing for destruction of environment and on uh, human rights and displacement. Um, probably again, Shoraz would be very much interested to uh, watch our videos. We have uploaded those videos on that link. Um, we tried in a very unique way to present all the victims of these so-called development uh, projects. And uh, they said their, their, their bits and there were judges. It was like a, a real courtroom type uh, scenario. There was no script, nothing. People were talking from their own experience. And one lawyer, I played the uh, prosecution's, um, prosecution team, head of the prosecution team in, in our uh, public hearing. So we, we just facilitated them to talk um, from their own experience and they um, put their allegations against, uh, against uh, investors, uh, lo both local and international investors. Uh, we issued even like a real court scenario, we issued notices to appear in this public hearing to the investors, um, the, both local and national and, and other government bodies who are responsible to oversee these uh, environmental issues, but none of them appeared. And But we sum up their statements, which we could find from the um, media. And uh, one of our uh, prosecution team presented their version of the story in the hearing. And in the end, there was a panel of judges 
they delivered so their job. You have so, 30, 30 seconds. Yes. So th this is the last bit. So uh, I think this is another idea uh, I could share with you. Uh, you may try this in, in different uh, projects in different areas of India as well. So I thank you all again. And it was really, really enlightening. And uh, we learned quite a lot from all the panelists. And thank you. Thank you. And hope to see you again.